Thank you all for coming. Just before we begin, I'm going to let everybody know to speak into the microphones. Just push your button. If the green light is on, your microphone is hot. And the restrooms for anybody that needs to know. If you uh, go down the hall and turn right and get to the end and then turn left, the bathrooms are down there. So basically, as you come in, if you walk past the registration desk and go left, you'll find the restrooms. This is a public meeting of the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. The date is May 16, 2017, and the time is 9.41. The location is the Department of Consumer Affairs, Headquarters 2, 1747 North Market Boulevard, room number 186, Sacramento, California, 95834-1924. The board's paramount responsibility is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, and enforcement in chiropractic care. Please be aware that this meeting is being audio and video recorded for live webcast. Please turn off or silence all cell phones. We will now take roll call. Dr. Azzolino, would you please call the roll? Dr. Heather Dane. Here. Mr. Frank Rufino. Present. Dr. Azzolino, myself, present. Dr. Julie Elginer is not present. Dr. Corey Lickman. Present. Dr. Dion McLean. Present. And Dr. John Rosa. Present. We have six members present. Dr. Julie Elginer is absent. Thank you. I'd like everybody to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before my chair's report, I'd like to introduce our new director of the Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, Mr. Dean Garofalo. Thank you for coming to our meeting. Thank you for having me. Good morning, Board of Chiropractic Examiners. As mentioned, I'm Dean Garofalo, the 42-day-year-old director of Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, I've been doing my darndest to try to get to as many of these as possible in my um, you know, first few weeks here. Um, for me, as a past uh, commissioner of the Athletic Commission, I um, absolutely appreciate your dedication to uh, this, this practice. Um, I know that going forward, we're going to be able to work together on many different things to um, not only and primarily protect the, the consumers of California, but simultaneously, you know, protect and improve the practice of, of chiropractic, chiropractic medicine here in California. Uh, before coming to DCA, I worked with three different assembly members. Um, most recently, uh, current assistant majority leader, Rob Bonta. He represents East Bay cities of Oakland, um, Alameda. Um, and then prior to that, I was chief of staff for former assembly member Warren Furutani. He's primarily out of uh, Long Beach and Gardena, California. Uh, previous to that, I was uh, legislative assistant for former Majority Leader Alberto Tirico. Uh, he's in the East Bay as well, uh, Newark and Fremont. Um, and I also lobbied for the California Medical Association for three years. While uh, with the California Medical Association, I was the um, medical board liaison for the association. Um, I should have paid a little bit more attention then. Um, didn't know. Zoom forward a few. Zoom forward a few more years. Um, I'd be the director of DCA. Um, and similarly, when I was on the athletic commission, um, unbeknownst to me, that was one of the you know then 39 entities under under DCA. As I shared with uh, with many of you briefly uh, before today's uh, you know gavel gavel going down, coming down. Um, it's been it's a true honor to be appointed by Governor Brown. Um, similar to how I approached 
the complex vaccine issues of not only this board, but all the entities under DCA. Um, when I was legislative staff, previous to um, coming here, I approached many of the similar kinds of vaccine complex issues uh, that uh, you know the office that I was in that we were faced with by trying to reach out with you know the true experts on the issue, as many different stakeholders on the issue, trying to get as a better understanding of all perspectives. Because in my mind, when it comes to the decision-making time, if I've gone about that deliberate process, I'm going to have confidence knowing that um, because of that process, I'm, um, I'm going to have, um, again, confidence in the decision that I've made because um, it was a robust and deliberate approach to, again, these often vaccine complex issues that, uh, again, not only that um, you know this board faces, but the other 38 as well. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't also share that, you know, 42, 42 days in, still learning about all the different entities, all the different uniquenesses of the, the, the many different entities under DCA. But fundamentally, I'm interested in yeah, telling the stories of how um, well we are serving uh, the state of California. Um, it can be as simple as you know improving processing times of of uh, licenses to um, you know the inf enforcement of unlicensed activity here in California. Um, too many times I think um, you know state government is, is is chagrined for you know not serving uh, the people of California. Um, I think we have a very very important role in sharing uh, many of our victories, small and large, and um, I, I plan to be party to that as director of, of DCA. I know you have a very busy agenda in front of you. Do not want to take too much of your time in any way. I'm happy to entertain any 42-day-old questions. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to take a moment to uh, congratulate you, uh, Director uh, Grafilo, on your appointment and to wish you well in, in your new job. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> we share some of the same concerns, you know, um, as the board. And uh, we represent the same boss. I was appointed also by the governor, uh, the great governor of the state, Governor Brown. And, and uh, at the end of the day, it's all about safety and it's all about public uh, protecting. So with that said, uh, thank you for your service, your previous service, and thank you for continuing to service, and uh, thank you for being here today. This is uh, actually great. I never, I don't recall having the former director being, uh, spoke to us while I served on this board, so this is great, and we wish you well. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Rufino. Thank you. Thank you very much thank you. for coming. I'll continue with the, the chair's report. So just want to, want to let everybody know it's been a busy time uh, since our last board meeting of February 16th, 2017. So first and foremost, Mr. Pooley and I participated in Sunset Review on February 27th. We answered, answered several questions about our, the current fund status of the board. We explained that the board is working on a fee increase. There were also a few questions about our jurisprudence exam and licensing time frames. Many of the questions we received seem to stem from a misunderstanding of our processes. We explain that we feel our processes are competent and efficient. Additional questions addressed uh, a criminal who was able to practice due to an unfortunate breakdown in communication due to a courthouse strike. We were able to explain the rarity of the situation and the steps put in place to assure that it does not reoccur. Finally, uh, we will be asking the Joint Committee to put language for a temporary fee increase into the Sunset Bill. This will allow us time to do an institutional review for the appropriate places for permanent fee increases. On March 7th, 2017, Mr. Frank Rufino, our Executive Officer Robert Puglio, and I attended the CCA's Legislative Conference in Sacramento. We had the opportunity to network with licensees I also spent the afternoon lobbying on SB 746, which was the pre-participation physical bill. 
we lobbied on removing the 24 visit cap in the workers compensation system and chiropractic's role, chiro, the role of chiropractors in dealing with the op opioid epidemic. Uh, Dr. Azzolino and I were prepared to attend the testimony for bill SB 746. Uh, unfortunately, the bill was pulled by the author. Uh, and on March 15th, Dr. Dion McLean spoke to the students at Southern California University of Health Sciences. I applaud her taking time to do outreach to the students about the board and our role in public protection. I have been in regular communication with the California Chiropractic Association and their president, Dr. <coughs> Leslie Hewitt, to keep informed of the association's activities and to look for areas of cooperation. On March 21st, I had an opportunity to speak to CCA's board of directors and department chairs about our strategic plan and pending regulations. CCA has a new executive director, Don Benton. I had the opportunity to travel to the board office to meet Ms. Benton. She has a terrific background working with regulatory boards and she has already attended some of our committee meetings. I am pleased that the entire board will get the chance to meet her today. On March 20th, uh, Dr. Julie Elgener and I, along with Robert Puglio and Marcus MacArthur, met with the DCA budget office to get more information about our current fund status and details about our pro rata. I look forward to their presentation to the full board today. And finally, on May 3rd through May 6th, I attended the Federation of Chiropractic Licensing Board's annual conference. After I attended last year's conference, Mr. Frank Ruffino suggested in the future any board member who attends a similar conference or activity prepare a report for the benefit of the other board members. And I would like everybody to know that my report is in your supplemental materials, along with some supporting documentation for things that I talked about in there. So as you review that, either today or in the future, if you have any questions about it, please let me know. There's several ideas in there that I think committees uh, can start working on as well. I have several events that are coming up in the near future. This weekend, I will participate in administering National Board's Part 4 exam at Life West. Part 4 is given twice a year, and I encourage other board members to participate in the future. Taking part as an examiner will give you insight into the excellence of the testing process. I have also found that it's very rewarding to see the students reach the, this major hurdle. CCA convention is June 2nd through June 4th. Dr. Sergio Azzolino will be speaking at convention about chiropractic neurology. Robert Puglio and I have secured an hour to speak about the board and answer questions. The board will also have a booth space so that we will be available to interact with licensees and stakeholders. From June 8th to June 11th is Part 4 Test Question Selection Committee at the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners Headquarters in Greeley, Colorado. Due to my many commitments in May and the beginning of June, I'm unable to participate in the selection committee this year. I'm extremely disappointed to miss it, but I would like to encourage the professional members of the board to participate in the selection committee in the future. The process is fascinating and you will also be networking with regulators from other boards from around the country. The experience is invaluable, so watch for the email next year from NBCE and Robert and take advantage of this opportunity. If you have any questions regarding my past experience serving on this committee, please let me know. Finally, I want to thank Robert and the board's excellent staff. Their help and support allows us to accomplish our goals and activities as board members to protect the public while we continue to work in our chiropractic offices or outside careers. Next agenda item. Oh, while I'm talking about FCLB, um, I, we have a guest in our audience, Cynthia Taze who's from FCLB. She came and passed out some materials to us. So as you look at that, or if you have any questions about FCLB, uh, please talk to Cynthia on the break. Thank you. Do you want to come say a few words, sure. Dr. Taze? Is this on? I guess it is. It is. My name is uh, Dr. Cynthia Taze. I am from the Texas Chiropractic Board, um, just past president, and I am an officer on the Federation of Chiropractic Licensing Boards. And since California has had a travel ban now for several years, we've missed 
getting regular representation from your state at our meetings. I know Dr. Dane has been able to go the last two years, and, and Mr. Polio was there this last time. But we also, besides the spring meeting, we also have a f autumn meeting, and that is just two of our districts, which is District 1, which is further north of here in the west, and District 4, which is your district. Um, it's more intimate of a meeting there. We get into working groups on issues that are common to all of our states. Even just in this short time of your meeting so far, I can already hear things that are common, at least to Texas and many other states. Issues with sunset, um, seeing your agenda, issues with licensees and in special situations. Um, the FCLB is here to support you in any way. I also, we have a resident in Texas and also one in California that we don't get out here as often as we would like. And maybe I'll try to get a license here someday and work here full time. But um, I've been wanting to come to one of your meetings for quite a long time. Just it's good for us to see how each other does the same kind of things and in what way we can improve and help other, other boards. So thank you all for your attention and hope to see you sometime when you can go. We and the next auto meeting is in October in Portland and I understand, you know, that's an issue. But the one the year after that is going to be our spring meeting is going to be in Mission Bay near San Diego. So hopefully if you can stay within the state, you can get more representation there. And I do Give my condolences to Dr. Dane for not being able to go to the test committee for part four. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity. And this will be the first year that I'm not going for several years since I'm not on my board anymore. But I know in Texas, everyone's just clamoring to get to go on that. And we got to go to part three this year, too. We don't always get to do that. But just to encourage other you know, professional members here that it's an incredible experience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taze. Our next agenda item is approval of our minutes from February 16th, 2017. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? I so move. Second. Thank you, Dr. McClain. Any discussion? There's uh, one modification that's necessary here with the meeting adjournment, I believe. Dr. Dane will probably adjourn the meeting on myself. Yeah, thank you. Besides that, I have no further modifications. Any other discussion? Excuse me, Chair. Yes. Um, the motion needs to be corrected to approve the minutes as amended. Right. So, I was going to wait for other oh. or public comment before I did that. Okay. Any, any other discussion? Any public comment? I will amend the motion to approve the minutes uh, with Dr. Aslino's correction. I'll second that. Call for the vote. Dr. Dane? Yes. Mr. Rufino? Yes. Dr. Aslino? Yes. Dr. Lickman? Yes. Dr. McLean? And Dr. Rosa? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to our executive officer's report, Mr. Puglio. Good morning, everyone. So, um, I have um, quite a few things to, um, to go over this morning. Most of them will be very brief, though. So. Uh, the, the first one is um, administration, and I'm happy to report that for the first time in a long time, we're, we're fully staffed. It seemed like at any given time, uh, we fill one vacancy, and then that would either create another vacancy because we'd hire from within or, uh, or somebody else would leave. So, um, so for right now, we're, we're fully staffed, and uh, I'm very happy to report that. In fact, um, one of our newest um, hires is here with us today, so I'd like to introduce her. Um, Andrea Mendez, um, stand up please, <laughs> so the board members know who you are. Um, she started with us back in December, um, I believe, and she's she's one of our enforcement analysts, and she's, she's been great. She's been working on a number of projects, such as the newsletter 
and other things in addition to enforcement. So she's a, um, a great addition to the staff. And um, thanks, Andrea. And while I'm introducing staff, I'll put other people on the spot. Marcus MacArthur is our policy analyst who um, all of you work with regularly, as well as Dixie Van Allen, who's our licensing and admin manager. And last but certainly not least is uh, Valerie James, who's um, our management services technician. She's my assistant, and um, I, would, I couldn't do it without her. She, she takes very good care of me. So <laughs> thank you, Val. And um, I don't want to forget the, um, the staff at the office, because they're all great. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a dedicated and hardworking staff. And um, I won't go through all their names, but we do have an org chart. Um, if you um, look under the tab 5A, or yeah, 5A, um, there's their organizational chart. And um, so all the staff are on there in their um, various capacities. And um, even though most of them don't get to come to the meetings and um, get credit for what they do, I, I just want to assure you that we have a hardworking staff. So on to budget, and um, we're fortunate um, because we're in Sacramento today, and, um, and especially at the Department of Consumer Affairs, we're fortunate to have staff from DCA's budget office um, who's here. So, um, as I mentioned at our last meeting, um, we our fund condition, or our fund is depleting. Uh, we, we've reached a point where our expenditures are exceeding the revenue we have coming in, and it's due to a number of factors. Um, one is just inflation and cost of um, doing business have gone up. Um, the uh, you know, our pro rata to both the Department of Consumer Affairs and state general pro rata for all of the control agencies that are funded by state departments um, have gone up, and uh, various other things go up as well. Um, we also have, although I don't think it's a significant contributor to um, our fund diminishing is uh, the decreasing license population. And that's that's something that we, we definitely need to keep an eye on because there is a steady decrease. It's been it's been very gradual. We had a significant decrease back in I believe it was um, 04, 05, we had um, fifteen thousand four hundred and twelve licensees. That was that was our peak. And um, Today, we have 13,166, the last time we checked. So, um, you know, so we're talking about um, 2,240 about, um, uh, licensees fewer than we did. So that definitely has um, an impact on the revenue we have coming in and um, may continue to do so in the future. In recent years, it's, it's fluctuated a, lit, a little. Some years, it'll go up a little bit, but, um, but the the long-term trend has been downward. So that's just, I, I don't have more to say about that at this point, but that's just something that we need to keep in the back of our minds. Any reports on that from the uh, SCLB meeting? Is yes, in fact, trend? I met with all of the administrators that were there from, from other states, and, and I brought that up, and, and they all um, said that they're seeing that too, that, the, um, that their license population is declining. Um, I. Um, I don't, do you know, um, Dr. Taze, in Texas, is there, um, have, have you seen a decline? We're increasing. You're increasing. Of course, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to be an outlier. Our, our, our biggest competitor. So, um, but, but yeah, across the country, and I know um, in, in speaking with um, you know, some of the chiropractic colleges, um, there, there is a decline in enrollment, so, um, so that, that's just something nationwide and certainly in California that um, we'll want to keep an eye on. And if we're able to uh, continue to participate at the national level with FCLD, maybe, um, you know, it, as part of a bigger pool of boards, uh, we'll be able to identify ways that we can address that. So, um, so I'd like to invite um, DCA's budget office to come up. Marina O'Connor. She's um, a manager in DCA's budget office. We we also have um, Wilbert Rongoa. I'm sorry, I probably pronounced that wrong. But, uh, <laughs> and I'm sorry, I haven't met you. So. Is this on? 
Uh, is this is on? Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, Kevin Driscoll, I'm actually the new budget officer. Um, oh. I did lose my voice on Saturday due to illness, but well. <laughs> every day is getting better, so I'll let my, my, my colleagues here kind of do some of the talking, but if I need to chime in, just pardon my raspy voice. Um, I did start two weeks ago, so I'm looking forward to working with you and your staff as, as we go forward. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Let's slide this over a bit. Yeah, so we have some, and I, I believe in your packets, um, there's some additional fund conditions that the budget office ran for us um, recently. And um, so um, I'll ask um, Marina and yes. Wilbert, um, you know, if you want to walk us through this and tell us. Sure, um, absolutely. And, and thank you very much for letting us come today and present all this material to you. Um, I'm going to actually, if it's all right, just start with the uh, expenditure projections document and then go into the fund conditions, if okay. that's all right. Yeah, whatever you think is Okay. Um, so one of the uh, documents in your meeting packets is at the top it says budget report FY1617 expenditure projection FM09. That's the one that has the yellow columns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has some different color columns on there. Um, it's in your books, in the board members. So I'll just, I'll just wait a minute. Um, I just wanted to start with that one, um, and then we'll go into the fund conditions because I know you got a lot of fund conditions handed out to you. Um, so this is our expenditure projections for the board as of fiscal month nine, which is March. Um, we just received the April expenditure, uh, sorry, April expenditure report. So we'll be updating this with uh, April's expenditures and updating our projections. Um, and we can get that to you as soon as we get, you know, that done. Um, so for now, we have FM9. Um, so as you can kind of see, there's several columns. Um, the first column to the far left is, uh, you know, some, some major um, line items, budget line items. Um, there couldn't be multiple things rolled up in, in some of these, but um, most of them, not all of them, some of them are self-explanatory. Um, and then as you move over to the right, we have our FY 1516 uh, expenditures, which shows you what your actual expenditures were at the end of last year and also what they were at the same point in time uh, last year. So it's, it's a nice comparison as well as something we um, will use in our projections as well. Um, and then the far right columns are all your uh, FY1617 uh, budget, uh, your expenditures year to date, which again was as of March. Um, and then we have our projections column and your unencumbered balance column. So um, the main you know, number to look at if you scroll all the way down to the bottom and the far right corner shows your surplus, um, which is about 1.8%. It's about $70,000. So that's what our projection shows that you will uh, revert to approximately $70,000 this year. Um, so we, we've worked with the board on these projections and, you know, as we get new information and, you know, new expenditure reports come out, we'll update those uh, accordingly. Um, so... Uh, if I can interrupt, yeah, sorry, sure, for just one moment. Yeah. I, I just wanted for um, the board members to um, explain. So what we're looking at is, um, this, as uh, Marina explained, is this year's expenditures. And what's important to note this year, as um, with every year, we stay within our budget, and you know we're we're not um, our fund isn't uh, isn't depleting because we're spending more money than um, than we're allotted to spend. It's just that we typically we um, we have a reserve, and that goes back into our fund, and we've um, so we've been able to uh, maintain a healthy fund. Um, but it's just for several years now the um, our revenue has declined and um, or, or remained stable at the very least and the um, expenditures have continued to increase so so we're we're dipping into our fund and that's the situation we're in so I, I just want to make sure everybody understands that and I, also I wanted to explain to them that you know, all these red that you see that where we've gone over in a specific line item um, those um, we have a bottom line budget so um, we the Nobody really is looking at um, those specific line items. Some of them are set in the budget because it would take a budget change proposal to change those, which is a um, kind of a lengthy process. And and so some of those are set at um, at numbers that are unrealistically low. 
but we don't worry about that too much because we know that as long as we're not going over and all of our line items and overall at the bottom line is that we're not going over our budget, um, that's not a concern. So I, I just wanted to explain some of those things that they may be seeing. In the mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's that's correct. Just to follow up on that, um, we bottom line budget. Um, you're going to see red in some line items. Um, the main goal is that, of course, you don't overexpend your 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 appropriation. So right now you're on track to save. Um, so doing doing fine. Um, so unless you have any specific questions on your expenditure projections or um, anything of that such, um, otherwise I can. Oh yes. Oh, sure. I haven't finished looking at everything, but one of our concerns um, is the pro rata. Mm -hmm. So it's gone up considerably from fiscal year 2015-16 to now 16-17. Um, a, a lot, um, you know, so... Mm -hmm. What kind of information can you give us about that? So um, one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at this document, um, you'll see in 15, 16, if you're looking at your actual expenditures as of month 13 on what you spent on pro rata, and you're comparing it to 17, 18 governor's budget pro rata, um, it doesn't, that, that budget, that 17, 18 governor's budget for, I'm sorry, um, your 16, 17 uh, budget for pro rata, it, it's, you're not necessarily always going to spend the full amount. There could be savings. Okay, so that's just your budgeted amount. Each year you can accomplish, there can be savings in pro rata. We just don't know till the end of the year. So you, I'd have to look back to see what you were actually budgeted in 15, 16 for pro rata. What because I'm looking it, at right yeah. now is 171,252 mm -hmm. for actual expenditures mm -hmm. in 2015, 16. And mm -hmm. actual expenditures current year just... Oh, the year to date. The year to date. Yeah. Two fourteen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it has so, it has gone up compared and that's to us. The whole, the whole right. Year. Right. And it's hard to say how much more you're going to spend for the rest of the year. Not you. It's the department. You know, in pro rata. Um, once we get the final numbers and you know do the full distribution, it could end up being more or less. Um, it just depends on you know what the department spent that full year. So it's possible you could see, and I'm saying possible because I don't know. We don't know until we get the final numbers. That 214, it could stay at 214. Like you could end the year at 214. You could end the year at lower than 214. You could end the year higher than 214. So what happens is we take your full, always project what you're fully budgeted for pro rata because, so that it's not spent on other things. And the end of the year, whatever that total is, um, it may come down. You may end up spending less. But what happens is throughout the year, the your budget's, uh, your your budget is basically, um, I guess it, it's quarterly where we take your full budget amount and we apply it to your budget. So we're saying, okay, every quarter, here's how much you're spending. But at the end of the year, we actually do our, okay, how much did we actually spend? So it could end up being less than what we, you know, charged your account or let or more. So it's just a, it's kind of a quarterly, I don't want to say a cruel, um, but we're basically taking like, here's your budget every quarter, here's how much of your budget would normally be spent. And then at the end of the year, if there's any savings, we apply that savings. Uh, but you can, never be, um, you can never be charged more than what you're budgeted. You'll never go over the 286, 236, all those numbers you see. It can only be less, but we're still gonna, we still apply it each quarter kind of evenly to make sure you know it's not spent on anything else and also so that we project your full budget, but it could, be the same at year end, it could come down, it could go up. It's hard to say where you're going to be at the end of the year. Well, that information yeah. is helpful. Yeah. Uh, one thing I, I want to clarify as well, because you're looking at the um, OIS pro rata, which is um, Office of Information Services, that's right. all of our IT. Um, I know that's and just one and that's, that's, been, um, that's been fluctuating. A lot of that has to do with Breeze, which I realize we, we don't have yet. We're not, we haven't been rolled into Breeze, but we likely will be. Um, and we still have our existing IT costs. But if you look down in that same, under that same departmental services heading, like for um, administrative services and executive, um, you'll see that um, last, the last fiscal year we spent 234,000. Um, so far this year we spent 173. So, so we're, not, um, we're not going a lot higher in every pro rata line item. No. You know, the OIS is, and um, 
and I, I believe we've gone up this year in like the statewide mm -hmm. program, that that's that's mm -hmm. gone up significantly. So there, um, so my, where there still are some things no, that are increasing. And your information is very helpful. Yeah. So now my question for you, Robert, is since Breeze has been in progress, you know the Breeze system, not not on our board, but you know statewide for a while. Are our expenses for that likely to level out soon? They, um, they likely will. I mean, the, um, you know, it, because it will average out. Um, Breeze, once, once we're fully rolled in, then it, you know, once all of the boards are fully rolled in, assuming everybody uses Breeze, um, you know, then the cost will be distributed on a pro rata basis. And so it will be, I don't know, um, to be honest, how the cost of maintaining and operating breeze compares with CAS and you know and if it is more expensive so so it, it may be ongoing it may be more expensive um, to maintain breeze and so our pro rata will be a little higher but but yeah there's you know a lot of the costs we've incurred so far for breeze were development costs that that's um, what I mean yeah, so my assumption that we will is eventually those are benefit go from. down <laughs> yeah. some because um, the development costs should be more than the maintenance costs yeah, because we were paying for development of breeze as well as paying for maintenance of cast right. and operation of cast. Okay, all right. Thank Are there you. any estimates when we may even uh, have any implementation we, of breeze? We don't have a specific date <laughs> estimate, but we, we are in the works. We've met um, with Jason Piccioni, who's the um, chief of OIS, and discussed um, our basic needs, and um, he's confident that breeze will work for us, but uh, now the legislature is requiring um, that we do um, a whole process analysis and um, you know and analyze what our IT needs are before we decide. Um, and since we're not already in Breeze, before we can go into Breeze, we have to um, we have to do a, a process audit and determine what exactly our business needs are, and that will um, inform us as to what our IT needs will be. Um, um, Jason believes that. Breeze will meet our needs, but until we've completed that audit, which we um, we're we're in the, the queue for that, uh, that'll be um, completed by the solid division, and um, they're sort of backlogged and have other priorities. So, um, but we have they have contacted us, and we're going to be having some um, meetings with them in the very near future, and hopefully before the end of this year, we'll start the the audit process. So. Um, uh, you know when that'll be completed, and then the next steps. I mean, it may be a year or more before, you know, before we actually get rolled into breeze. But but the process is in the works. Uh, one thing to note about, <coughs> excuse me, the the pro rata. We did come out with an email recently that has the, for the annual open house to all the execs and the boards that does contain a pro rata packet in there. That how we determine and assess and charge pro rata. So if you have questions, your staff has, we can definitely work with them to help understand that that packet and how Parada works and operates here. Yeah, the concern is that I think it's probably going to be another couple of years to be conservative on the estimate of when we actually may benefit from Breeze, and uh, we certainly have been paying quite a bit thus far, so it'd be nice to see if we can move that along. And I, uh, I, we're not actually, you know, we're, we're paying for the services we're getting. We're not paying for the Breeze services that we provided to other courts right now. We did pay for development, development yes, and we will eventually benefit from that development. We're just not benefiting yet, and so um, so we will get what we pay for as far as that. We pay our share of the development, and we will. Um, Sorry, I don't have the song. Um, we um, we will um, eventually, you know, get the benefit from that. It's just that we we're delayed, so we we have quite a few. We're in addition, um, and one thing I um, well. Go into that later. Sure. Okay. Um, any other questions on expenditure projections? I know pro rata probably seems as clear as mud right now. <laughs> I apologize. It's to be honest, it's not it's not a simple process. I mean, there's a lot of cost centers that go into determining you know how much each board pays their you know share of pro rata. So I totally understand if it seems like a gray area. But um, as Kevin pointed out, that that guide is extremely helpful. Um, breaks it down by you know each unit, what they do, how the costs are calculated, and of course, if you have any more questions or if you want even more detail, you're welcome to reach out to us and we can provide more information on you know how those how we do those calculations. 
Okay, um, I'll move on to the fund condition then if uh, no other questions. Um, I believe the one in your packet, I think is, is it the governor's budget one? It says uh, 1718 governor's budget, right? Uh, yes. Okay, and it, it shows uh, your 1516 actual and your 1617 current year and 1718 budget year, I believe. Yes. Okay, all right. Okay, um, so this is, um, as I was saying, the governor's budget fund condition. So you, sh you see your 15, 16 actuals there, what you actually brought in in revenue and um, all of your actual expenditures uh, below that for that year. Um, and then your current year 16, 17 budget. Um, so what we, you know, what was projected revenue that you'd bring in in 16, 17 and what your, uh, you know, you were appropriated um, as well to spend. Um, and then also the 17, 18 projections. Um, so as, you know, uh, Mr. Puglia was pointing out, um, if you, you know, go to the very bottom where you're looking at, you know, your fund balance and your months in reserve, you see a, it's a, a rapid decline. Um, so that's, as he had also pointed out, because of the imbalance between your revenue and your expenditures um, over a period of time. Um, so the only other thing I wanted to point out on here was you'll see the loan repayment to uh, BAR, Bureau, Bureau of Automotive Repair, in 1617 for about 1.25 million. I believe there's another point, or another 250,000 yes, outstanding. Yes, yeah. yeah. Right, right. From and what I um, it was transferred. Yeah, so um, uh, that, I, I'd actually, I think we looked, we double checked on that, Wilbert, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I don't think that has transferred over yet. Um, I think that was the remaining balance um, that has yet to be transferred over. And so I think um, it's at, you know, of course, the board's discretion. And as far as, you know, what it says in, you know, statute, as far as when it can be transferred over. So uh, Yeah, because I know yeah. we have a lot of flexibility right, in our right. MOU with, um, with BAR. And mm -hmm. so that's something I'll have to discuss with the department right. and mm -hmm. uh, the BAR executive office and um, determine if um, for a few years going forward, we, we can maybe scale back on, because we were mm -hmm. ambitious in mm -hmm. wanting to pay that back, mm -hmm. but um, given right. our current situation, um, we may want to uh, be more moderate. Mm -hmm. And the only thing else I wanted to point out too, and it's in relation to your expenditure projection document, um, so you'll see on your fund condition um, under the expenditures section, um, the very, I believe, last line under there, it says statewide general admin expenditures pro rata. That's your statewide pro rata. Um, you'll see on your expenditure projections that in 15, 16, um, I believe it's under uh, interagency services, you'll see a central admin pro rata expenditure that drops off in 16, 17. So it's there in 15, 16, but it's not there in 16, 17. Now that's because um, they've just changed how they're uh, um, basically charging uh, departments and boards for uh, statewide pro rata. So instead of budgeting you for that expenditure and building it into your budget, they're just directly assessing it to the fund. So that's why now you'll only see it on your fund condition at the end of the year, what was assessed to your fund for statewide pro rata rather than seeing it in your budget and, and rather than being budgeted for it just comes out of the fund. Maria, um, would you so mind, um, for yeah. the sake of the board members, sure. um, letting them know some of what those, you know, because that's, I'm assuming, um, for the control agencies and oh, so on. Oh, right, So let right. them know where that statewide program right. is going. Just mm -hmm. Yeah, it, there's actually a long specific. list of <laughs> departments that make up statewide parada. So I, I, wanna, I could probably get you this. I want to say it's like almost 20, but um, other departments. But you're right, like oversight agencies, uh, you know, our oversight agency, Department of Finance, State Controller's Office, all those other state agencies that either, you know, that provide the department a service in some way. Um, is rolled up into that statewide pro rata. So that's what those those costs are. Thank you. Um, and then uh, the other thing to point out, of course, again, regarding the um, structural imbalance of the fund is that it looks like, um, you know, based on governor's budget, which I just want to point out, assumes you bring in the revenue that's projected you're to bring in and assumes you spend your full budget authority that the fund would go and solve it in 1819, fiscal year 1819. Um, now, if you do revert, um, have a reversion, let's say about 70,000, it, it doesn't really affect that too much. It has a, you know, very little impact on when you'd go insolvent. You'd still go insolvent in 1819, but of course, you know, it also depends on how much revenue you bring in, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to point out the assumptions that go into that are based on, 
you bring in your pro the projected amount of revenue and that that revenue um, stays consistent in future years and that you spend your full appropriation each year. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. sure. I The uh, information that you gave us about the pro rata, can mm -hmm. you go back to that? Is sure. That, yeah. You were on the statewide. Oh, on the statewide. Sure. Sure. And then, can you? Mm -hmm. So send if you it look at. Off and yeah, on, if you look at your expenditure projection document, so that's the FMO nine expenditures. Yes. If you look under the interagency services. Yes. There's a line there called Central Admin Services Pro Rata. Got it. So you'll see in fifteen sixteen as a month. From uh, at the end of the fiscal year, I see that it was 157,000 or yes. about 158, and then you'll see in 1617 it's all zeros. Right. That's because they're no longer building that cost, that statewide product, into your budget. They're just directly assessing the fund, which is now why you see that line on your fund condition under expenditures that says statewide general admin uh, expenditures Where it went from program. Zero in 15, mm -hmm. 16, no, and then in 1617 185. So about? yeah, in fifteen sixteen, uh, it was one fifty seven or one fifty eight, rounding up, Wait a and then. Oh. Where are you? So on the expenditure projections um, under fifteen sixteen. Oh no, I see that right. Yeah, the right. one fifty eight. Yes. Okay, and then if you look over on your fund condition yes. under sixteen seventeen, you'll see they're projecting um, a one one eighty five that they'll be charging you one eighty five, and of course, like I had explained with all pro rata, it could end up being less. Um, right. So that so it's kind of just shifting it document wise. It's it's not going to be shown on your expenditure projections. It's going to be shown on in your fund condition. So I know if I want more information about mm -hmm. the pro rata, yep. you have the document that just got emailed out a couple days ago. I got that mm -hmm. email and the um, the meeting that they explained mm -hmm. it. But 185 to 240 mm -hmm. seems like a pretty big jump. Um, how do they? I mean, if that's that's what they're anticipating and that's what they're budgeting sure, for. Sure. Sure. Why? That, that's a good question. We don't honestly get a lot of information. Um, we just, they tell, you know, we, we get this information from, you know, our oversight, you know, Department of Finance on, you know, what their projections are. They, they like all pro rata, they have their own calculations, right, for coming up with how much they're projecting. They're going to have to charge all their, you know, all the other agencies. So it would hard, I don't know how much information we could get on how they do their calculations and. Well, um, I'm assuming if yeah. ours has gone up a chunk, mm -hmm. everybody's oh, gone yes. up a chunk. Oh, yes, right, absolutely. So right. they know mm -hmm. what's causing everybody's to mm -hmm. go up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm assuming they could, I don't need the minutia, sure. but I would like to know why they're doing something different. Right, everybody's right. Yeah, is I think going up by that much, I mean, and I'd like to know what that is. Yeah, speaking at a like very high level, it's um, assuming you know, like same with our department. If you you know do a BCP and get additional positions, your costs you know as a department are going up. So what you're going to be distributing you know to everyone is also going to go up. I mean that that's one component that could be driving. Um, you well, know, I think the cost, that's yeah. what I'm asking is mm -hmm. just some generalizations of mm -hmm. we hired five new people, right. therefore our costs are going up, right. that's why everybody's pro rata. Yeah. To, to it's gone up proportionally yeah. ours by, mm -hmm. you know, almost $60,000. Mm -hmm. um, so they, I, I'm just looking for general terms. Yeah, well, they yeah. probably do build in a certain percentage of inflation. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> and, and in recent years, um, you know, all civil servants have received salary increases, which um, they're probably uh, projecting that in because some of them are phased in over it's like um, two or three percent a year for so many years. And so they're, they're probably projecting a lot of that in. And Marina, is it safe to say that um, they're projecting 240, but it might actually be less than that? Y yes, absolutely. It's it's again, it's just a projection. Um, so you know, they they look at the same things, similar things that we do. You know, their BCPs, more positions going up, cost of doing service. There's all kinds of drills that drive our costs up, such as you know, employee workers' compensation, uh, retirement, um, you know, ratios. Those all affect, you know, the the cost of you know a department, any but department providing I would services. Expect that to maybe raise it. Ten thousand sure, dollars. Sure. I mean, this is a yeah. this is a big jump from mm -hmm. fifteen sixteen to sixteen seventeen. I mean, from sixteen seventeen to seventeen eighteen. But then they don't project it's going to go up that mm -hmm. much. So if it was this, this well, gradual, you know, yeah. Just to clarify on that, 
Um, we only actually, governor's budget only goes up to 17 to 18. So we do our own projection beyond that. We just assume there'd be an increase beyond that. So just to clarify, we only have projections for 16, 17, 17, 18. Anything beyond that is internal where we're just assuming there's going to be a slight increase. That worries me even more because yeah. if there's a, it, mm -hmm. then it's going to go up to 300,000 and then 300, you know. Oh, I don't, so yeah, it may or may not. I'm just yeah, saying yeah. That, right. that concerns mm -hmm. me even more because yeah. the actual number could be different. It Absolutely. Could be a lot different. Absolutely. So that's why mm -hmm. I'm interested in knowing what the jump is. It mm -hmm. went from 157 mm -hmm. to 185, mm -hmm. which is high but not horrible, mm -hmm. and then 185 to 240. Mm -hmm. So we're like, you know, it's the great unknown. And <laughs> the next um, two years, what's going to happen? That's why I want to know: is there something in general terms mm -hmm. of why that went up so much? Whether it's raises or new hires or. <clears throat> Well, let me let me try. So finance has a methodology to, to calculate their product. So the brochure that we handed out that you got is going to be completely different from Department of Finance's product calculation. If you look at the their library, there's a the product library out there, and it covers a three year period. And basically, they do catch ups and over under. So if they bill you for a certain product and you come in way under, they're going to tack that onto the the future fiscal year. And if you come in over, they're going to reduce your parada that following fiscal year. And so it's a very nuanced process that finance has in place. Um, we can definitely look back at some of your previous paradas and see how much they've increased. Um, as far as getting the nuances of it, we'd have to work with finance to see if there's any mechanism that is causing that to greatly increase. But I'd, from my experience, it's an over-under catch-up. It's literally a three-year window that they're working with that finance does. So if that's the case, if it's just when you guys were under last year, this is your catch-up, mm -hmm. that would be great to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it comes out usually in about September is when we find out the next year's parada assessment. So this September, we should see what possibly 1819 may look like. So in September, you may know if that jump was because of an under Yes, and if you, on the finance website, it'll show a rollover, either a plus or minus mm -hmm. from one fiscal year. You skip a fiscal year, if it's over under, then it applies it to that future fiscal year. It's, it's very clear as mud. <laughs> it's frustrating because I know there's not a lot we can do about the prorata. But it's important for us to understand it so that we can sure. prepare for it. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there any any other questions on? Um, I just had one question sure. um, back to that. Since there um, for for current year um, projections and monitoring the current year budget, since it's not shown as a line item, um, mm -hmm. how are we? We just have to keep that in the back of our head that in addition to these other expenditures, we also have, you know. Well, so just to be clear, it, it's not, you're not budgeted for it. So you're not, you know, when, the, when, when it goes against your fund, it's not coming out, it's not being, you know, it's not going against your appropriation. Right. It's so not, yeah, it's not going against our appropriation. Right, it is right. coming out of our fund. Yes, it and is. So, so, so our the, fund is going to be depleting right. um, by more than what our... So it's would it, right, but it's built into your fund condition, so that that amount is factored into your your remaining fund balance already. So that fund balance, if you look at your fund condition for sixteen seventeen, includes the statewide pro rata. Okay, but you're right. If it if it changes, right? If it ends up being less, maybe you could have a little bit more, you know, a little bit higher fund balance. Yeah. But to be honest, it would have to be a pretty significant change to not to have any different, you know, to basically. Have any significant effect on your fund balance when it goes insolvent? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So then, I guess we want to move on to the projections for. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Um, the May revise mm -hmm. does that have an impact at all, or any changes any of these figures? Um, no, I don't. I don't believe there's anything that will. Um, no, not that'll impact your board. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so then in light of our um, impending fund deficit, we, you know, we're, we're already working with the legislature and with the department to figure out um, how much revenue we need to, um, or how much we need to increase fees to generate enough revenue to keep us solvent. And we're, as I mentioned, we're looking at um, a short-term fix um, because this is a um, sunset year for us. Uh, we have two options. We um, and I've already spoken to staff and the legislature about the possibility of um, putting a temporary fee increase 
in either a sunset bill or an omnibus fee bill. And it would, the legislation would specify that that fee increase would only be in effect until a certain date and then would go back to the, the 250 unless um, future legislation is enacted. So um, in the interim, we're going to be doing a fee audit to look at all of our fees and determine um, what they should be, what's the appropriate level for them to be. And then we'll come back with a comprehensive fee bill that will address those things. So, um, so looking at the short term, we've asked the budget office to do some projections and determine how much uh, revenue we need to keep us solvent for a few years until we can contract for the fee audit and then do the regulation to raise the fees in regulation. Which you know that that as we know those processes aren't short, so we'll probably need about three years. Um, to complete all of that. And um, so do you want to walk through the? Um, sure. So uh, the fees, the fund condition scenarios we provided, um, I believe there are five. And those are in the handouts in those blue folders. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, after discussions with the board, we basically just assumed an overall either 10, 20, or 30 percent increase in revenue across the board, meaning across all the fee categories. So it wasn't looking at one particular fee and, and the amount we'd increase that fee by. It was just an overall, um, you know, revenue projection. So how much more revenue would it take to get, you know, solvency by to this year, to that year, to the, the following year? So uh, I believe we, um, I don't think it's in your packet. I actually forgot to bring it with me. I think Wilbert has it. Um, he put together a, a nice chart of, um, based on these projections, how far that would carry your fund out to, um, you know, from not going in, insolvent. Um, so I don't know, Wilbert, do you have, did you bring? I did bring that chart, yeah. but um, it I forwarded it in the yeah. email. So based on the scenarios, I did uh, 10 to 50% roughly. And based on the percentages, um, I showed how many years um, each percentage will sustain the board, uh, the board's fund. So I believe the 20% scenario uh, pushed the board out at least four, four years, I believe. Yeah, just, just looking at these, 10%, um, uh, at 10%, the board's fund would go insolvent in 1920. <clears throat> at 20%, it would be 21, 22. And then um, the ones in your packet don't show it going out beyond 21, 22, but um, you know, each 10% increase basically pushed it out another year or two. Um, and uh, you know, th that, that's again just very high level revenue analysis of you know, how much more revenue you need to bring in, um, not looking at specific fees. Um, so it's just to give a wide range of scenarios and, and, and things to consider. Yeah, I, I think what we may need to do short term is just look at the renewal fee because mm -hmm. that's the only one that's in statute, mm -hmm. and um, and so the legislature could easily raise that, and then um, once we've done the fee analysis, then we can adjust all the other fees and possibly the renewal fee as well to um, to put them at the rate that they should be. Yeah, and there were some, um, and Wilbur, you can correct me here if I get this wrong. We you know built in a few assumptions when we did this too. I think. One of the assumptions was that the fee increase would actually uh, start mid-year in 1718. So, you know, that's just an assumption. Um, we can work with the board on, you know, changing these assumptions, you know, based on if we just want to look at renewal fee and when we would, you know, start that fee increase. So we can, you know, adjust the scenarios accordingly. I have a question. Yeah. It, when you... Um, looked at different scenarios, um, was it based on the same number of licensees? Um, I, yeah, yeah, go, ahead. go ahead. Okay, so, a, a so when I built in the, the fund conditions that you see before you, the assumptions that were made, um, again, just to clarify, were a broad assumption until uh, legislation um, is looked at and the fee audit is completed. We just did a broad... Um, Ten, uh, percentage increase through all the, the fee categories. And the assumptions that we made, uh, there's a couple of things. Paying back the uh, loan to VERF or VAR, as you guys know, and also the population remaining steady. So the decline that you guys have talked about is not included in the um, scenarios. And then, 
I'm sorry, the bar repayment is or is not included in the scenarios? It is included in it scenarios, is. but it's included in $50,000 increments. So it's just basic. Per year? Per year, yes. Okay. Per year, yes. Yeah, yeah he, we just did a broad assumption of just spreading that payment out across several years to kind of give an average of basically it being paid back. But, I mean, again, we can work with different and scenarios. We yeah. don't have a significant decrease in licensees from year to year. So I, I think, you know, for the next five years, we wouldn't see enough to really make a difference in these numbers. Okay. Um, so did anybody else have any questions regarding the budget or the fund? I know um, Dr. Elginer had um, sent me and you an email yesterday, and one of her concerns, of which we addressed, but just for the benefit of all the other board members, um, she was concerned that because in the, the current year projections, um, lost that tab, but in the current year protection, projections, we, um, we show that we'll have um, an $80,000 surplus um, in salary and wages and she's coming from the private sector, so she's thinking that could result in them cutting our budget by that much, um, assuming that we don't need that money. And um, I explained to her in a follow-up email that that's not the case, um, that we, they wouldn't reduce our budget because we're not spending that. It, it would just revert back to our fund. So in case anybody else had that same concern, I didn't bring that up. Well, again, you'd want to look at your bottom line. Um, <clears throat> the governor's budget doesn't go into it as detail as this does. Yeah. It, it shows your appropriation amount, and they don't get into the nuances of the line items. So as long as you're staying within, they're not going to come in and cut personal services based on this encumbrance type projection. Yeah. Thank you. So what's the next steps? The, no, we well, the next steps, um, we'll be working closely with the budget office and with the legislature. Um, I'm in the process of um, trying to schedule a, um, a meeting with the staff at the Senate and Assembly BMPs. I've spoken with them on the phone, um, and um, they want to set up a meeting, and we'll talk with them about um, the possibility of putting it in one of their bills, uh, putting a, a temporary fee increase, which would just be for a renewal fee. So um, you know, we have... They have a, um, a fee worksheet. Um, both houses have one that um, we've started filling out and will provide to them. Um, you know, it's just basic information about um, you know what our um, what our fund condition shows and um, you know what our you know how many years before we um, we are insolvent. And so um, you know we'll go over that with them. We may invite DCA's budget office to sit in on those meetings with us and determine what an appropriate amount is. And um, you know unless something doesn't go as planned, I I'm hoping that we will be able to do the temporary fee increase, and then that'll um, give us enough time. That'll give us a few years to um, complete the fee audit and um, determine what the fees actually need to be. And then we'll go back to the legislature and have another bill um, that addresses all of the fees comprehensively, and we'll have to do a regulation as well. Um, I guess I have two specific questions. Number okay. one, um, who will decide on the percentage? And I know you need more information because it's just going to be on renewals, not on all the rest of it. And number two, um, will that number require a vote of the board? No. Okay, that's um, what I want to know. That's yeah, all it, I want to know. Okay. All right. No other questions? Thanks very much for um, going, getting through that with us. I know it's, <laughs> it could be a little much. painful at times. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, on to um, licensing. And um, we have the, um, it's under tab C in the board members' uh, binders. There's, um, there's a, a a page that's called the Board of Chiropractic Examiners Licensing Trends for those of you um, in the audience, and it gives um, it just gives for uh, this fiscal year um, since July okay. um, what the licensing totals, and these are just um, these are just a moment in time. These like for that first box total population of chiropractic licenses that shows us a moment in time. So when we ran this report in July, it was um, thirteen thousand two fifty one. Um, you can see that it, it goes up and down a little bit throughout the year, but right now, as of April, um, 
we were at 13,166, so we're fewer than we had in July. But, you know, um, we also know that in June, we usually have um, a surge of new applications, and so that number will probably go up slightly. Uh, again, these, these numbers, it's, it's hard to look in the short term and come to any conclusions to just looking at six months or a year because it does fluctuate throughout the year. But looking back um, over several years, we can see that there, there is a consistent downward decline. So, um, you know, and then it gives numbers for canceled licenses, satellite offices, et cetera. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about this chart. Um, if not, I'll move on to 5D, which is compliance unit statistics. This is the um, this is the same information we provide at all meetings, and the far right column gives the current year. So this isn't um, the, this, the current year is not a full year of um, statistics. It's it's just through this was printed May 3rd. So just through May 3rd, these are you know the number of complaints received was 395, and so on down. Um, the line, and um, and then you can compare where we are this year. We're close to the end of the fiscal year, so you can compare where we are this year and where we were in years past. And um, I, there's no real anomalies. It's, we, I, looking back at you know, in the past, I've looked back at um, prior years, and there are fluctuations in number of complaints received, and number of accusations filed. There filed. It, there's no real. Reason you know that we can explain it's just some some years we have more complaints some years fewer complaints um, it's not an indication of any any trends or anything um, but I'm happy to answer any questions about that and also in the following pages Robert, before you go there yeah. um, in regards to the citations and the fines issued when was the last time that those fees were revisited in light of you know. Like the fines, yeah, the, um, the, you know. Well, we have a five thousand. We have a five thousand dollar maximum fine that we can issue, and so um, we have a certain degree of discretion in, in administering a fine. You know, so a lot of times for a first offense or a relatively minor offense, it might be a hundred dollars or one hundred and fifty dollars. Um, if it's if it's repeated, if we've disciplined this person in the past for similar things, then it um, it might be higher. If it's something that's um, fairly egregious, yet not to the point where we, we would be seeking revocation and going through the accusation process. Um, you know, we could um, issue a fine for twenty five hundred or even five thousand dollars. That's very rare that we would um, issue a five thousand dollar. I guess my, my, my question is more based around when you say the the minor offenses at one hundred and fifty dollars. I don't believe that we could even justify um, charging such a little amount if we look at how much staff resource uh, goes into investigating that. I mean, are they going up proportionally with? Um, they're not. They're not really based on um, the cost of issuing the fine and processing it, because enforcement is part of our budget. Enforcement is um, paid for by the general license population, and we do like in um, the more egregious cases that go to hearings. Um, oftentimes, we can we get cost recovery, or the, although we rarely recover. As much as it actually cost us, they a lot. If it goes to an ALJ, a lot of times they'll um, they'll adjust the cost recovery. So if our total costs, including our investigative costs and our um, attorney general costs, are say fifteen thousand dollars, the the judge may reduce that to ten thousand. So we're um, it's not necessarily making us whole, and it doesn't account for the administrative costs. They when we get cost recovery, it doesn't account for um, you know the the enforcement staff in the office, the work that they do in processing that complaint and um, shepherding it through the process. Um, we don't get compensated for that. That's paid, um, our enforcement staff is paid for by the overall um, renewal fee. Mm -hmm. Yes? When you said that you um, looked at trends, um, what kind of trends did you look at? I know that last meeting we talked about trying to analyze more um, or have an analysis of some type or trends that might occur. There, yeah, and there are no, I mean, um, there are no real trends. I mean, we, we look at, you know, like numbers of complaints, where if you look at the total complaints received, um, you know, so far this year, based on last year, there's there's no anomaly there, um, and you know sometimes it, it may just so happen 
that um, in any given year we we may have more sexual misconduct complaints than than we had in the year past. But you know that can that can change from year to year. We we do sometimes notice trends in um, specific types of complaints um, that. You know, all we had never seen before. Um, pastoral medicine is a good example. A few years ago, nobody had ever heard of pastoral medicine, and then all of a sudden, we we started seeing that there were more chiropractors who were engaging with that association and using that title. And um, you, but that's likely to be short term. We um, in a few years, um, especially if we do start. Um, Finding that there's um, violations occurring in association with that, um, we and we're disciplining. Then fewer chiropractors are being claimed to do that, and um, then there may be something else. Um, I, I remember in um, years past we received a lot of complaints related to um, laser lipo, or um, there. And, um, when I first started with the board, there was the DRX 9000 that. Um, a lot of chiropractors were using, and it wasn't the device itself that was a violation. It was um, the marketing that was going along with it. And so we had a lot of enforcement cases related to that. And we, through enforcement, I, you know, the, um, the word got out that that's not something that the board is going to tolerate. And, you know, and then we saw those decline. Where now I, I haven't seen a complaint or an advertisement um, related to the DRX in several years. So, so it, it's hard to, um, you know, we can identify those kind of temporary trends, but there, there are no trends that say, you know, for the, the constants like insurance fraud or sexual misconduct, we don't, we don't really see um, much of a fluctuation in the, you know, in the numbers of those kind of complaints. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, um, it's, it, it's, it's hard to pinpoint on, um, you know, trends in those types of things. Um, because they, they do change, the types of violations do change, um, and things that we weren't aware of at one point, then all of a sudden we start to see. Well, when we talk about trends, for instance, what you're saying in regards to the DRX 9000 and pastoral medicine, those are certain trends that are manifesting as a result of education that's out there. And I think, uh, although it may not be evident in the short term, certainly we've ramped up our efforts significantly in regards to bringing the board meetings to the schools and the educational material that we're providing. So I would think um, we would hopefully see uh, some some benefit to that in the, in the long term. And I think it's incumbent upon us to continue to monitor those trends of what is being taught out there and certainly continue to educate our stakeholders because if, if we could do a better job of educating people on what not to do, we are truly serving the public, I think, at the highest level, rather than being reactionary. Um, certainly, we have to combat that with, I think, you know, the use of the internet and whatnot is going to uh, you know, make it much easier for people to, to disseminate that information, and hopefully is going to make, make it easier for people to file complaints also. So. Yeah, the, the internet and social media um, do create new challenges because information gets out there very quickly. Um, it's almost impossible to monitor um, what information people are putting on websites that um, many chiropractors have um, their own personal um, business website. And they may also have Facebook and Twitter accounts. Um, they, they may advertise via Groupon or... Um, you know, something like that. So it's, um, you know, I, I would say consistently our, a lot of our violations um, that we see and a lot of the, um, the micro trends that we see are similar in that they're related to marketing. Like these are things sure. that they, they learned through um, attending a course on how to increase your, um, your number of patients, how to grow your practice. And, and then they teach them things like you can advertise. Um, more recently, we've seen a lot of um, weight loss type clinics um, coming up in chiropractic offices, and we've received complaints related to those. Um, and so that's um, more likely than not. Um, somebody's out there marketing. This is something that you can do, and, you know, and advertise. And they, and along with the marketing, they give them the advertising, and you know, so we'll see different chiropractors who aren't related have almost identical 
um, advertising. Somebody down in Palm Springs and somebody up in Reading will have almost identical advertising. They probably never met unless they met at whatever the seminar was that they attended. Um, but there, um, you know, we were seeing a lot of that with those diabetes seminars that were happening at um, at restaurants where they they invite uh, they invite the public to come and learn about diabetes, and then there was um, they would have them come in for an exam, and they would tell them that they're appropriate for this um, type of treatment, and you know the costs were prohibitive, and, um, and they you know there were a number of issues that went along with that that were problematic. So it wasn't, the problem wasn't that they were advertising that they can treat diabetes. It, it was the whole marketing scheme that went along with it. And so, they changed that. <laughs> but that's good. Yeah. So in turn, when you see trends like that, like you said, like wh whether it's the laser or because um, like the DRX, there may not be uh, infractions related to the actual instrument or issue, but infractions related to advertising or whatever. Advertising or excessive treatment or, you know, um, things like that. There's sometimes there's some fraud involved with that. So, yeah, so we, you know, because um, even going back to pastoral medicine and being a member of the Pastoral Medical Association in and of itself isn't a violation. But some people, as part of that affiliation, are committing violations. Um, I think it almost we... always boils down to deceptive advertising. Right. Yeah, it, and yeah. Almost there's... every single one of these instances is just making false promises, you know, or, or promises that they are not able. Certainly, to there are some that are just outrageously obvious. But um, for do we do anything um, like on our social media um, to um, when you see things like that, just blurbs, you know? reflecting the inappropriateness of X, Y, or Z, or anything of that nature? That can be problematic, and I, yes. I don't know if um, Spencer would agree with me on this, but I mean, if, we're, if we single out something, if we start to notice, oh, we're seeing complaints related to this, um, you know, we, we could be stepping out on a limb if we start telling, you know, putting something on our social media saying, um, this is a violation, or um, you because know, they, they're, they're not necessarily, necessarily they're targeting to one thing, but general reminders of advertising regulations. regulations, you know, just out there to let them know. Okay, these are the regulations regarding advertising and marketing. Um, just be aware, yeah. informative, yeah. not yeah. not saying you know. Yeah, because it boils down to it boils down to. Um, violations that we've traditionally seen, like deceptive advertising, fraud, um, excessive treatment. The, these are all things that stem from these marketing schemes. But so it's not necessarily the marketing or, or the device or whatever they happen to be using. It's how they're using it and how they're marketing it. So um, so you could basically yeah, publish so we that could, each and every uh, we could uh, publish that. Um, yeah, say you know it's like you know there's these these types of things that, yeah are so yeah we can um, try to get more information out there about deceptive advertising and, um, and that sort of thing. It's a cat and mouse game, unfortunately. The way I see because these guys are uh, they're marketing geniuses and they're just trying to stay one step ahead. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a su suggestion uh, for the Enforcement Committee, because uh, I know one thing that has been discussed in the past is being more proactive about putting information out there, and there's several outlets we have to do that. We have our newsletter, we have our Facebook page, we have um, publications, so it's we don't have to try to specifically address each for lack of a better word, scheme that comes along, but maybe remind people of what the regulations are. And then, especially with social media, it's part of our strategic plan to put a public publication together for social media. So that may be a good project for the enforcement committee to work on and then come back to the full board with some information. So I don't think it's a, something we're gonna solve at our board meeting today. Yeah, and, and we just, we never know what the next one is. And you don't realize it first. I mean, you get one complaint related to something and you don't realize that there's going to be a pattern and then all of a sudden you get another one or you start seeing advertisements and sometimes people will just cut an advertisement out of a paper or send us a link um, to something that somebody's advertising that um, appears problematic 
And oftentimes, that in and of itself isn't enough for us to take discipline. You know, the, you can see that there may be a problem with that advertising, but without investigating and finding out what they're actually doing in their office, um, they're, you know, we, we may not be able to cite them for anything. And so, uh, advertising violations are very difficult to go after. So, um, it can be subtle sometimes. Robert, yeah. Question. On the fine, yes. have we ever crunched numbers on people who owe us money? For example, somebody's coming before the board, they want to get their probation to lessen, to lift down. You know, less than half of the money that were, they were fined have been paid. We've, yeah, and we've done a number of things to address that. As far as fines, if we issue a fine to a licensee and they don't pay it, of course they have the right to appeal. And um, sometimes as part of the appeal, they have an initial appeal with, um, with the executive officer. And sometimes if they provide some mitigating information, I may reduce the fine or so, you know, or um, if I deny their request, they can take it to an administrative law judge. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately if the fine is upheld and they don't pay it, we have the ability to submit that to the Franchise Tax Board and they'll put a lien against um, their, any future tax returns. Um, so we, we are able to collect um, from people who don't pay, we are able to collect through that um, and um, we can, you know, we, do we do this often? Yes, on a regular basis. We, uh, it's called the Franchise Tax Intercept Program. Right. So we use, we use that regularly. As far as, um, as far as cost recovery, like if it's somebody who was revoked um, right now, you know, as you sometimes see uh, when they appear before the board, they, um, they're seeking to get their license reinstated, but they owe the board 15000 or 20000 and they've never paid any of that. Um, and so we've started writing into, at least for stipulated settlements, and when we redo our um, disciplinary guidelines, we're going to put in there that we'd like our orders to, to say that um, the, the cost recovery, that amount, must be paid before they petition for reinstatement. So, um, so that will address that. Because we really have no leverage for cost recovery until they try to reinstate, and then if they haven't paid the money, then that's something the board takes into consideration when determining whether to um, reinstate them. Robert, can I? Is there a way that we can get that cost recovery done no matter what? Because I mean, it's a cost that we incurred. They went through the process. Why should they not have to pay that back no matter what? Whether they decide to get their license back or not? Because what if they decide not to get their license back? Well, I don't have to pay that. Well, and that's where we would have to have it written into the, um, which we've started to do, um, have it written into the order if there is cost recovery in the order that um, that it it must be paid before they petition. Now, if they never petition, then we don't um, we really don't have any leverage to because we don't have jurisdiction over the license because they don't have a license anymore. So there's really nothing we can do. To, it's just something that's hanging over the, um, the person's head. If they do want to get a license again, then um, they would have to resolve that first before they could. And th that's not, um, because we don't revoke a lot of people, so that's not a significant fiscal impact on us. And, um, now, as far as people that end up on probation, um, we can require them to pay whatever the amount is. Um, before their probation is up, and usually, because you know, sometimes, oftentimes, they they're not able to pay it in one check, or so, so we will set up a payment plan. If they're on probation for three years, they can pay us so much a month over the course of three years, and as long as they paid it in full before their probationary period's up, then their probation will end. But if they haven't, they'll remain on probation until they resolve that. So is that currently set? How, is that how it is set right now? Yes, yes, that's how it has been. We, um, so, so we are, if somebody's on probation, then, you know, if they want to eventually get off probation, they're going to have to um, take care of all those obligations before, before their probation ends. The budget issues, I bet there's a few bucks there. Yeah, we, you know, overall, we get, I mean, there's certain um, things you just can't collect on, but overall, we do a good job of um, recovering um, our costs. And, and again, um, cost recovery isn't, you know, in, um, in, accusations and cases that go to hearings, um, that, that is something that's above the ordinary because we, um, you know, we have 
investigative costs, oftentimes we have, we send it to an expert witness and we have the um, costs associated with that, and then we have the AG costs. And usually the bulk of the cost recovery is our attorney's fees with the AG's office, and you know, that can be, depending on um, how big the case is and how long it drags out, I mean, that could be ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 in AG costs. So that's usually um, the lion's share of um, our expenses in the cases that, um, that are beyond what our day-to-day -day business is in enforcement. Thank you. So, okay. Um, uh, so now we go on to um, Pastoral Medicine um, Association. There's, there's a letter in your packets that at the last board meeting we uh, were requested to, um, to invite um, the association itself. I mean, we haven't engaged with the association. We've um, we've engaged through the enforcement process with um, chiropractors who are using that title, um, and some of the problems associated with that. So uh, we we've invited the association to um, attend one of our board meetings and um, present us with information about themselves and answer questions. Um, we haven't received a response um, to their letter. Um, we did tell them the the remaining board members and board meetings we had this year. So um, I, we, go ahead. Do we even know what they do in pastoral medicine? We have, they have a website. There's, um, it's, it's a membership association and they, they claim to vet these individuals who, um, who they grant membership to and, um, and you know they based on their credentials. So if somebody has a degree or licensure, a certain area, then then they'll it seems minimal. They'll grant them membership in this association, and they call themselves pastoral medical doctors, which um, that can be problematic because the acronym for that is they they'll do something like MD and then parentheses P or something. So it it appears that they're a medical doctor, which um, I don't know, but there are any medical doctors who are pastoral medical doctors and. Um, you know, they, again, just um, being a member of this association in and of itself isn't a violation, but if you are doing um, advertising that's deceptive and leading the public, public to believe that you're a medical doctor, or if you're, um, if you're attempting to exceed your scope of practice um, based on this, we, we've also, there's also situations where um, someone, um, you know, because this, the people who become patients of these individuals are members of this association and they have them sign agreements um, that they won't take their complaints to a regulatory board, that they'll resolve them within the association, which isn't enforceable by the way, but you know, there's, uh, we have found um, that there are cases where the, the chiropractor that we're looking into thinks they're exempt um, from our jurisdiction because they're a pastoral medical isn't the case, but you know. So there's, there's. These are the type of attendant problems that go along with this. It's not, you know, if somebody was just a member of this association, it wouldn't necessarily be a problem. But often there's behavior that goes along with this that is problematic. Do we have any uh, statistics on the number of chiropractors that are involved with this? We don't have statistics, but um, there's, I. It, yeah, there's um, there's not a lot. I mean, you know, there's enough to be a concern. There's, um, but but it's it's not a significant percentage of our licensed population. You know, there may be a dozen in California. Has the medical board looked into this as well? Um, I don't. We had a conversation with the medical board um, several years ago about this. Yeah, um, it's in the medical board. It's something that's on everybody's radar, and uh, you know, it's. Um, I know being at the FCLB conference and talking with the other board administrators from across the country, um, they they were all aware of this, and some of them have had enforcement cases, some of them have just um, heard about it. So it's something that's not just in California, it's across the country, but it's, it's on everybody's radar. And you know, right now our um, best tool for dealing with it is when it comes to our attention, um, you know, addressing it if, if somebody's committing a violation, we address it through enforcement, because, uh, you know, at some point, if they're trying to circumvent our regulation through this association, they'll realize that that doesn't work, and, you know, so then the interest may wane. Okay. 
Yeah, the, the problem lies is that most of these individuals think they're exempt from any oversight from the regulatory boards, whether it's chiropractic, medicine, osteopathy, or whatnot. So um, they're basically establishing a brand new profession without licensure. You'll see on their website they'll want to do something out of scope, and then there'll be an asterisk next to it, and you'll look and they'll say, I, you know, practice this under pastoral medical board. Yeah, so and one of the reasons we invited them was so that we could ask these questions. Um, as, as Robert said, the other, uh, the avenue is through discipline because one, once a case has discipline, number one, the word will get out, and number two, there's, uh, there's a record and something to base further cases on. So. Thank you. Okay, and then I think my last item. Sorry, just one second. Um, so, oh, um, oh no, that we have um, online um, online licensure. We've been working with uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs cashiering office, and um, they they we do have an option, and we've been working with them for several months. Um, we can contract with an outside vendor, and this would be until we are rolled into Breeze. Um, we do have the ability to allow allow licensees to pay their renewal fees. It, it wouldn't apply to all of the fees we charge, but they'd be able to pay their renewal fees online. And um, it would be done through an outside vendor. There would be a, a small service fee and, um, and a percentage of the amount that goes to the credit card companies that we're not allowed to pass on to the licensee, so we would have to absorb that cost. Um, but hopefully that would balance out through um, efficiencies and um, less actual um, work, you know, uh, hands-on work that went into processing these. <clears throat> so as a convenience to our licensees, we're looking into this. Their um, DCA is working with the vendor and trying to um, get dates from them where we can implement this. Um, so far, we don't have a definite date, but um, but it is something that we're um, we keep following up with DCA, and I know um, they they've been actively pursuing this. So um, you know, hopefully by the next board meeting, I'll be able to report that we have an actual date where this will be online. So until we're rolled into breeze. Um, licensees who wish to do so would be able to renew their license online. That would be great, and I know that licensees would love it. Oh yeah. Um, I would just put out a reminder. Hopefully, that the the amount that we would have to pay to the vendor that we can't pass along to the licensees, like you said, would hopefully be balanced out in efficiencies. Um, however, since we are talking to the budget office about increasing fees, we might want to keep that in mind because yes. I think a lot of people. Will want to do the online renewal. Yes, definitely. And um, then the last thing, um, well, it's not the last thing. Um, sorry, there's, um, I have to keep flipping back to the agenda. Um, so, yeah, there's Sunset, um, which Dr. Dane. Um, uh, provided a, a good summary of, of the sunset of report. I, overall, um, I was pleased with the report. I was, um, so some of the issues, because we did receive an issue paper from the, um, from the committee, and some of the issues they raised, as Dr. Dane um, mentioned, um, were due to a lack of understanding of our process, and they weren't really issues. It's just um, they were perceived as issues because they didn't understand how we, um, Accounted for uh, certain, you know, certain license or the processing times. Um, not all boards um, start their clock at the same time when they have an initial license come in for review, and so um, it appeared that we were taking longer than other boards um, to process licenses. That wasn't the case, and we were able to explain to them what our process is and why um, those numbers appeared longer. Um, so, and there, there were other. Um, you know some other issues that were anomalies. I mean, you know, I think the the big um, the big thing that they pointed out that we had realized shortly before, um, you know, we had to appear before the sunset committee that we were going to have to raise fees, and so they they also were looking at that and were concerned. So um, 
uh, you know, but we've, we've been in communication with them. We've assured them that these are things that we already have processes in place to address some of the concerns they did raise. And um, overall, I was pleased with um, how we fared in the sunset process. Um, they're, they're still yet to, there's not much they can do with us through legislation because um, as some of you may know, um, the sunset process is designed to um, actually sunset or um, repeal boards that aren't um, co uh, completing or um, meeting their mandate and, you know, uh, don't have um, an effective use anymore. You know, there's, there's some, you know, some programs aren't necessary to uh, protect consumers and that's what they try to determine through the sunset process. Um, they, they can't sunset us because we were created through an initiative, so we don't have a sunset date in our, all the other boards have actual sunset dates written into their acts where their, their board will cease to exist, exist after a certain date if um, it isn't extended by the legislature. They can't do that with us, so we, we participate in the process, um, and when they do ultimately have a bill that, um, to implement the sunset provisions, it'll say that um, we will continue as if we had a sunset date. There's some strange language they have in there. Um, but they, they can um, suggest things that they would like us to change or address. Um, you know, most likely they wouldn't go in the sunset bill because most of the things that affect us aren't accomplished through legislation, they're accomplished through regulation. So, but, but whatever their recommendations are, we'll, um, we'll work with them and implement them how we can through regulation or otherwise. So, and... Um, have they issued the uh, final uh, report? No, we haven't received a final report. Oh, Marcus has something. I just want to let you guys know, um, our responses in the background papers from the legislature are on the board's website, so you can review them, the concerns that the legislature had in the report, and then also our responses to them. So yeah, so that was the, our last official action was responding in writing. We testified at the hearing, and then we responded in writing to the issues, um, and we haven't heard anything since. So as, as a result of that, they will, um, you know, that's why they have these sunset bills. Um, and to implement the recommendations that come out of Sunset. So. I just had a comment because um, I attended um, Sunset Review just to observe, and I just um, encourage all the board members, if you get that opportunity, if you have not, to do it because it was very enlightening, not just watching our board and what transpired, but also observing some of the other boards <coughs> and um, some of the things, issues and things that um, come up. So I just wanted to encourage others to do the same and thank um, Dr. Dane and for inviting me. I too want to, I did watch uh, from my office and I want to commend you guys, Dr. Dane and Robert, for uh, the line of questioning that was occurring there and your responses. Uh, I know it was you guys did a good job. Yeah, you prepare based on the um, based on the issues that they raise, and you prepare to, prepare to respond to those. But they can also throw things at you that you know you weren't expecting, and so um, that can be interesting. But um, we overall, I thought they were pretty gentle with us. I mean, I, I've, I've attended sunset hearings where it wasn't pretty, and so um, I, I was I was happy with the way things turned out. So um, then. Yeah, okay, strategic plan. Um, so we have, um, I believe, uh, in the back of the room for the people in the audience, we have a copy, a printed copy of our strategic plan. Um, we, the board members, do have a um, photocopy of the strategic plan uh, you know, with our um, proposed and actual implementation dates. And, you know, we've, we've just got it start, gotten started on um, implementing the new strategic plan and some of the committees have uh, begun addressing um, you know, the, the tasks that are within their purview. So. I, I just had a comment to make. Uh, this I love, thank you, for giving us a little pocket strategic plan <laughs> version that we have. And that's, that's a tangible um, example of our pro rata, those, you know, the, these nice publications that we have. Um, the Department of Consumer Affairs is able to print those. The newsletter, which is also in the back of the room, um, is edited and printed by the Department of Consumer Affairs, and they do they do a very nice job. And we have um, 
I know going back to the FCLB conference, I was um, I shared our publications with the other administrators um, from across the country, and they seemed very excited. And you know, were uh, to see the publications we have and, and how nicely they were printed. And I know some of them said they were going to bring them back and share them with their board members. So we're we're fortunate to have that service. Um, at our disposal and to be able to come up with these um, nice publications that we can present um, you know, when we attend the CCA conference. We'll, we'll have a booth and we'll be able to bring these, uh, this information and pass it out. We have brochures pertaining to um, the chiropractic profession and the board and you know, geared towards consumers and geared towards um, licensees and these are also available in other languages. Um, so this is, these are all again part of our um, pro rata that we pay, we have access to these publication uh, services, and I'm very pleased as well. And then one more uh, thing about the strategic plan, I'd like to encourage the committees to look at the strategic plan and what they're uh, listed under responsible party for and start tackling those items in their committee meetings because there's several things that can begin to be addressed. And um, the, the strategic plan is on our website as well. Um, all of our publications should be available on our website. If anybody looks for a publication and doesn't find it on our website, please let me or someone on the staff know, because um, it may be hidden somewhere. Uh, we try to make them easy to find. Um, or uh, sometimes um, we've had, sometimes through glitches, something that we thought was on there all of a sudden isn't. So please let me know if you're looking for a publication and you can't find it on our website. And just one last plug, um, you know, for those of you in the audience, um, licensees in particular, if you're not already on our email list, um, you can go to our website and um, there's a, an icon for get on our mailing list and you can just put your email address in that and then we, we notify you of upcoming meetings and changes in the law. We also, when we have a new publication, a new newsletter or something, we, um, uh, you know, we share that with the people on our mailing list and it's a great way to stay informed and um, please tell your your friends and colleagues to also do the same. We also have Facebook and Twitter accounts, and uh, we try to get information out through those. And so every time I have a chance to speak to the public, I like to let them know, um, you know, please sign up for these alerts, because uh, sometimes issues that we have to deal with, um, enforcement or otherwise, um, are things that people could have found out about if they had received the email or, you know, seen the Facebook posting or something. So that's all. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item number six, Radicate, ratification of approved license applications. Can I hear a motion? Anyone second? Thank you, Dr. Hartman. Okay. <laughs> Any discussion? Any public comment? All right, I'll call for the vote. Call for the vote. Dr. Yes. Item number seven, ratification of approved continuing education providers. Motion to approve continuing education providers. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Any public comment? This is Exhibit 7. Call for the vote. Dane? Yes. Pino? Yes. Adelino? Yes. 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 Thank you. Item number 8, ratification of denied license applications in which the applicant did not request a hearing. There's none of those. So we'll move on. to item number nine, introduction of California Chiropractic Association Executive Director Don Benton. And new governmental affairs, right? <laughs> I'm making Jillian come too. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Hello, nice to meet all of you. I'm Don Benton. I'm the new executive director of the California Chiropractic Association, and this is Jillian Hacker, and she's the director of government affairs and operations. And we just wanted to say a quick hello. Are we able to see the video that um, 
that was sent over. Is that possible? Dr. Hewitt. I mean, I thought you guys were going to be prepared to show it. Well, oh, we had provided it in advance because I didn't think we could. I thought you always had to provide video, you know. Yeah, no, I, I, I apologize. I, um, that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We have a lovely video that <laughs> we'll send you. <laughs> okay, okay, that'd be great. Um, Basically, the video is, doc is our president saying that we're going through a major reorganization, rebranding, and it's an exciting time for CCA and, um, you know, to, to come along with us on the journey. And we are very excited to be here. I've only been with the organization a month and a half and um, just been going through everything, uncovering every rock and figuring out why we do everything we do and, and hoping to... Um, take CCA to the next level and greatly expand our membership. So uh, we have a weekly newsletter that we've started going out and if you need to send anything out to our members, we're happy to help with pushing news out. Um, we'll give you a little area whenever you need it. And we're really excited that you're coming to the annual meeting and hope to make this an annual excursion so that we can increase the communication between our members and the BCE and and increase trust as well. I think that would be really helpful. And I think letting our members know why you do what you do and the limitations that you have and the priorities that you have is really important. And um, and then making sure that we can provide our members into your rulemaking process wherever you need expertise. We want to make sure we can do that too. So that's really it. Just wanted to say hello, and I look forward to working with all of you. And did you want to add anything? Um, just to mimic everything that Don just said, basically. <laughs> and um, if you want to start getting our weekly newsletter, let me know. I can maybe get addresses from Robert, email addresses from Robert, if you're not receiving it already. Um, and really, really looking forward to working with all of you. I'm, I'm sorry, did, we, we just found out, is your video on YouTube by any <laughs> Um, because he can access that and, and we can show it. If oh, sh sure. Only, yeah. only if there's time. Um, we have time. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> while they're so getting this. Would you mind letting? Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Know Do you want me to forward it to you? I can probably find it in my email. You, Faster you than identifying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. You can. You I can, can find it. I have my email okay. open. Let me okay. go do that real quick. Nice to meet you all. <laughs>
Uh, having a little trouble. We apologize. Apparently, there's a problem with the audio. So, um, but we we will send that. I, I assume that's that's available on CCA's website. It's for anybody in the audience or watching um, on video that wants to see that. Yeah, there's there's quite a few. She does one quite often, so that particular one is somewhere. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. So you know, anybody who's interested can um, go to CCA's website and um, you know, contact I'll, me. Or yeah, or even contact me, and um, if you can send me the link, and if anybody contacts me, I'll, I'll send them. Okay, the link. I'll do that. Okay. I have the link that I'll send to the other board members as well, so they can watch it, um, and then look on YouTube. You saw Leslie's face on there. If you see that one, you're probably on the right track. Um, there's several on there, but I think it's the newest one. It's the one on top um, is the video that she sent out. Do, do the board members have any questions for Don or Jillian? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, the next. So the next uh, item was the update from the Department of Consumer Affairs, which uh, the director already came and introduced himself at the beginning of our meeting. <clears throat> I think at this point we should probably uh, um, let's see. So it's, uh, the C committee, legis the governmental affairs committee, and then. Well, the, the mm -hmm. legislation and the regulatory or regulation updates um, take long. Well, yeah, quick. yeah. Yeah. So, so, Dion, do you want to give your uh, continuing education licensing committee report? Oh, all right. Um, Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Heather Dane for um, the opportunity be to become chair of this very important committee and for the staff for all the hard work that they helped um, us do. With the Licensing and Continuing Education Committee, we are tasked with ensuring the continu continuous competency of all doctors of chiropractor by promoting licensing standards, professional conduct, and requirements for continuing education. Um, we have been diligently working on our strategic plan objectives regarding chiropractic entrance requirements, um, interface with the CCE, um, online access, as Robert spoke about earlier, which we're very, very happy, and we're sure that the stakeholders will be very happy that there will be that access coming. Uh, development of new continuing ed courses established, enhancing or enhanced approval standards and auditing of continuing ed courses. We have made progress towards completing some of these objectives and goals that we have established. However, upon further evaluation, we feel that the objective 1.7, which is evaluate and make determination about amending the Chiropractic Initiative Act, we feel that this would be more appropriately handled by the executive committee and thus um, should be moved to that committee or to, should be moved to the executive board um, in general. Additionally, we have had an ongoing task of reviewing and discussion on possible revisions to Section 360 through 366 of Title 16 of the California Code of Regulations regarding continuing education. We have encountered some continued challenges regarding establishing and enhanced, enhanced approval standards. 
and auditing standards, which is why we have included the Arizona regulations for the review of the executive board as well as the public at large. We wanted to look at these regs in an effort to establish a foundation which we could build upon with the hope that we would, uh, would help alleviate some of the challenges in the development process of our own regs. And we wanted to get the opinion of the entire executive board, especially the professional members on the aforementioned or on um, the Arizona regs and the thoughts, particularly um, in the area of uh, several questions um, which have been posed to you, and if in case you didn't have those um, available, the questions that were really burning for us were, what do we, what do you believe um, individually as is the purpose of continuing ed? Um, establishing a purpose will enable us to um, establish our regulations or to prove provide proof of whatever um, components we establish which is very important in the regulatory process, as um, Mr. McCarthy has um, ensured us. So we wanted to, I wanted to um, just pose those questions once again um, regarding the purpose. What competencies um, are necessary for a licensed chiropractor to safely practice, um, i.e. ensure the public protection? And how much continuing ed is necessary to ensure minimum competencies? Because the minimum competencies are what um, are the most important. So those are the questions that I wanted to um, open up to the executive committee and get some input on, as well as um, for specific details to ask that if you have specific details as you've gone through the Arizona regs, um, that you might email me the details of your suggestions or recommendations, and that way we can compile it all together and then maybe bring it back to the committee so that we can continue our efforts in establishing um, this, this pro or completing this process. Thank you. So that I can be clear and for uh, efficiency purposes, mm -hmm. um, what I'm hearing is you would, you post the questions prior to this board meeting about, you know, what's the purpose of CE? What areas do you think that doctors of chiropractic need CE in to stay competent? And then the third is how much CE do you think is necessary? And then lastly, if you uh, as you go through these regulations, the Arizona regulations, or if you have notes already made, please submit those to Dr. McLean via email so she can have them. I'm sorry to interrupt. Reference. I'm at advice of legal counsel. Oh, um, I'm just to repeating. avoid any badly keen yeah. uh, violations. Oh, I'm if you, sorry. If you to, have any comments, Robert. yeah, send them that. to me, yeah, and to then um, and then I'll share yes. them with the committee. Exactly. So. Yes, send them to Robert, so Robert can share them with the committee. But the the per the point is that they have a. Uh, a written document that can be referred back to, written information that can be referred back to, and we're not trying to scribble notes during this. So send them to Robert, and Robert can share them with the committee. So Dr. McLean, did you want individual answers from everybody now? Do you, do you want them to submit those to you in writing about the three questions you asked? Or do you just generally want to know if they believe that the Arizona guidelines are a good uh, basis uh, you know, a good shell to build upon. Well, I, I definitely would like to know the opinions of the board on whether or not they believe, after reading this, that the Arizona model is a good model to begin the process, um, is a good shell for us to begin um, building our foundation upon, as well as, of course, just a little bit of insight of it, of what you feel the purpose of continuing education is. I, I'm going to start just Go ahead. talking, and I was chair of this committee before. I think the purpose of CE um, is to ensure that providers have a minimum competency when caring for the public. I'm going to keep these short and sweet. Number two, I think that there are several areas that are necessary for continuing education, and I think the Arizona guidelines outline a lot of those fairly well. We might want to make some modifications to them, but that would be something for the committee to discuss. But they have several areas in there um, that 
are very appropriate for continuing education for chiropractors, but not so broad that everything gets approved for continuing education. Um, and the third answer is I'm happy with our 24-hour limit right now. I think that maybe there might need to be some tweaks in the required areas, but I'm happy with the overall hours. Uh, and the, for the last one, I think that the Arizona uh, reg that you provided is a really good, has really good bones for your committee to build on. So you can move along to the rest of them too. And just one um, little caveat on the, the um, number of hours. If you have recommendations specifically um, at, like in the Arizona packet um, that pertain to um, electives versus mandatory portions, please put that in your email as well. Okay, thank you. Dr. Aslina? Yes, um, I believe continuing education has to go far beyond minimum level competency. It's incumbent upon every individual out there that's uh, entrusted with one's health to maintain current with modern day science. And science and medicine and every other specialty in healthcare is uh, advancing at a fairly rapid rate. And uh, I, I don't believe uh, it is appropriate for us just to maintain our current level of knowledge. I think we need to be advancing and, and having a better understanding and making sure we're always uh, as contemporary as all other specialties out there. So I think we really need to focus on that because there are many in our profession that are quite antiquated and outdated in their methods of delivery. And uh, I think that provides a great disservice. And if we're really looking at patient protection, then, for instance, anybody delivering chemotherapy better be up to date on the most current advances in chemotherapy. I'm not saying, well, I'm just providing the basic level of competency and we shouldn't hold chiropractors to any less standard. Um, so I do think the Arizona guidelines are very appropriate, and I think we should move towards adopting something like that. I checked in with a couple of their licensees this morning on the way up here to feel how they felt, to see how they felt as licensees, if the if they were too restrictive or not, and they were actually quite pleased with them. Um, they also have a statute that requires two hours of mandatory record keeping uh, every two years, which I think is extremely important um, because, uh, as we know so often with many of our cases in, involved in enforcement, they're always getting dinged on one thing or another for record keeping. So I think uh, instituting some very specific things like that will be very beneficial for us. And so uh, I, I think, you know, overall, everybody's done a great job on the board in regards to continuing education, but that is an area that I think we need to put a little more emphasis on if we're really doing what we're supposed to be doing here, and that is protecting the public. And, you know, I've been screaming about being proactive rather than reactive with all these cases. And I think continuing education is a perfect opportunity for us to be proactive and make sure um, we vet uh, the providers a bit more. And, you know, we're going to experience a great deal of backlash with that. We'll still be, you know, uh, we should, you know, we should be so easy about uh, accepting providers just like we should be so easy about handing out licenses when, it, when we're here to protect the public. I just want to comment on that. I, I think that we're on the same page. A minimum level of competency to me would be keeping up to date on current procedures. Like you gave the chemotherapy. I, I would expect somebody who was doing that, a minimum level of competency would be aware of what's sure. going on. So I, I, I think we're on the same page. I also want to remind um, you know, the board members that if you have specific um, comments about the regulation, the Arizona regulation, to make sure that you email those to Dr. Uh, to Robert because Dr. Robert. to to, <laughs> to Mr. Julio because it's it's hard to keep track of all of the information um, and all the comments here, and we want to make sure the committee has has all of that information and for expediency in our meeting. I just want to speak to the minimum competency term because it, it sounds almost negative. Like, why would we want to have a minimum competence, but but that's what we enforce. It, you know, even in admitting people to the profession, when we issue um, a, a license, people aren't tested to see if they're the best chiropractor. They're tested to make sure that they have the 
minimum level of competency that someone needs to practice safely and appropriately. And you know, and so when and I um, I raise this at the licensing CE meeting, and I'll raise it again. Uh, when we do the regulations to change the um, uh, the CE requirements, uh, we have to demonstrate the necessity. And so if, if we're going to require them to obtain CE at a level higher than what's necessary to fact, practice safely and effectively, we have to justify that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't try to do that, but, um, but you know, we will have to look at what, what is the need. As a consumer protection board, is that we're here to protect public and make sure that um, licensees are, are able to practice safely. And so, what? How much CE do they need, and in what areas? Because you know, in um, comparing Arizona's regs to ours, if you look at their, and it's on page eight of their, um, the the first part of this starts with Article Eight, Continuing Education, and you go to page eight, and at the bottom it starts listing the courses that they will approve, and um, and if you notice their they're very specific and very technical. Um, our, um, our list in our current regs of approved courses are very vague. Uh, you know, we have things like philosophy of chiropractic, and, um, you know, which it's, um, it opens the door for just about anything. And then staff has the problem of de you know, determining, is this class on <coughs> stretching? I mean, there, there was a class in the past, uh, probably still offered um, with Pole stretching, and it's not it's not inappropriate. It's, it sounds bad, but no. But I mean, they're using bamboo poles to um, you know to perform certain exercises and stuff. And I, I mean, I think there's there's benefit to that. But is does a chiropractor need to know how to do that to be a safe chiropractor? You know, to be an effective chiropractor. And so, um, do we want to allow those kind of elective courses? And you know, and if they're not, because we have the eight hours of mandatory courses that um, the chiropractors have to take. And so we have to ask ourselves, if those are mandatory, they absolutely have to take those, then are the elective classes even necessary? And I, again, I'm not trying to lead the board in any direction. I just, these are things that I'd like you to consider when we're looking at um, what we, you know, what we need to do to, to ensure that our, our licensees are up to date um, you know, and know what they need to know to be safe. Yeah, we are, a, for better and for worse, a healthcare delivery branch that has seen a significant amount of change. And so if you look at an individual that was trained 30 years ago, if they're continuing to practice according to their training and what they received 30 years ago, they are very out to date on many contemporary uh, advances that can benefit people. So I think our continuing education should at the minimum be at least uh, be representative of modern day science. And when you get into things like the philosophy of chiropractic, as much as I love it, it doesn't have any place in continuing education as far as maintaining a standard. Uh, because as you know, what ends up happening in those situations is uh, uh, those classes turn into everything from practice management courses to marketing courses to you know, uh, spiritual courses, and those are all great to take, but that, that shouldn't be what is required by the board. Duly noted. And you'll see in the Arizona regs that's not in some of the, um, the subjects that they will approve. So, again, review those and give your uh, specific responses and changes to uh, Robert so we can pass along to the committee. Uh, Mr. Vina? Sure. No, I concur. I concur with the uh, previous comments and with the previous speaker, and I think we all recognize that we need to um, strengthen to the best of our ability, you know, those minimum requirements. And, and uh, so I, I certainly um, uh, encourage us to continue, you know, to look at, at these minimum and, and, and support, you know, the efforts. And I think that, um, again, to reiterate, that minimum may be a term that's not quite appropriate. Maybe we sh the term should be adequate mm -hmm. um, at best. 
But again, just reiterating what Dr. Dang said, that these, just like when you're graduating from any college, um, there are minimum requirements, and then going above and beyond that is what we would love to see. But these are what are at, what would be adequate um, minimum standards for them to achieve the goal, not you know that it's um, reflective of of the of what we're saying at all. Dr. Lindner. I obviously agree with everyone, but to, you know, to increase and ensure the standard of care of all doctors and chiropractic, um, you know, for the ability to increase the ability of a chiropractor to in, in increase their uh, skills and, and knowledge is, is obviously why we do continuing education. Um, you know, and, and it's uh, it's if you're not increasing your skills, then uh, you know you're 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 hanging back a little bit. So. And I have notes uh, regarding the Arizona that I'll send to uh, Robert. Great, thank you. Dr. Rosa? You know, it's been said. Um, I think the Arizona uh, <coughs> work is, is, is a good model. Because we came out of it. Um, I think the 24 hours is, is fine and doesn't need to be adjusted. I think it's been better over and over again. But, is your mic on? I'm sorry. Turn your mic on, Dr. Rosa. Um, so I'll, I'll put it in writing and send it to Dr. Robert. Dr. Robert. Uh, Dr. McClain, did you get the information we need? Or besides um, the specifics about the reg, did you get what you need as far as uh, what we all kind of think CE should be? And I think I think so. It's a good foundation, and and again, um, once I I receive the information from Robert, I, I it'll give me a better picture of um, whether or not their the task is completed as far as gathering of the information. But that does, you know, reflect. I, we I wanted to see if we were uh, if I was on the same page as some of the other professional met members, um, as well as just put a pulse on it, and I think that's been done. I'd, I'd like to add, I, I know Marcus wants to say the, something, but um, uh, Mr. Walker just pointed out, and I, it's a very good point, um, that in one of the requirements in their CE regs is that each new licensee must retain a, attend a board meeting. And, um, and we've all discussed the benefit um, of attending a board meeting and seeing um, what the board does and the petitioner hearings and so on. So that may be something that we want to build into, like maybe annually attend a board meeting or, you know, they're held throughout the state, so it shouldn't be too much of a hardship for, but, well, I don't know, but, but at least once, you know, like, yeah. it, you know, in your first few years of licensure, attend a board meeting. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to address is, you know, because um, we, we should determine what's a reasonable amount of time for everybody to find, provide me with their feedback, because I'll want to provide it to Dr. McLean before the next licensing committee meeting, and I don't know exactly when that'll be yet, but, um, so, um, the end of this month, the middle of June. I, I don't know what um, you all think is reasonable, but let me know um, so we can decide. Dr. McClain, when would you like the information back? I would say by the end of the month. Okay. Gives okay. us a couple of weeks. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Marcus, do you have something? Yeah. Um, so I've been working along with Dr. McLean and the other members of the licensing committee and been um, it's been a it's been an interesting conversation. So we, I respect the comments that you guys have made. I just want to pose um, a, an additional question or two to clarify and help us along in this process. Um, so one of the things I'd like to know, or have you guys discussed, if possible, um, one of the things that we um, we pressed Dr. McLean on because we wanted more information. Um, it seems like across the board, you guys are pretty okay with 24 hours of CE, which is fine. But we were interested in kind of how the eight hours of mandatory, um, if we dove into that a little more and we started thinking about what are the core competencies that a chiropractor needs to practice safely, are there, could there be, or would it be necessary to ma maybe make adjustments to the, cr the current way that, um, the way that the courses are distributed or the requirements are distributed. So are there certain things that are necessary? Like you just need to be updated on these things every single year. 
versus things that maybe are not necessary or even necessary for an elective. So are there things that fall into this category? And then also another thing that we talked about is possibly having um, a mandatory, say, one or two hours of emerging issues slash updates in the practice of chiropractic. So I think that a course like that could address some of the concerns that you had, Dr. Azzolino, regarding, you know, staying up, staying update, staying updated on things that are happening in the practice. And um, so these are some of the things that we talked about, and I'd like to hear some of your responses if possible. I think that the, the way that the hours, the mandatory and the so-called elective hours are distributed uh, could definitely use a change. Um, yeah. yeah. If I can interrupt. Uh, yeah, because yeah, I would argue if we're saying that these eight hours are necessary, is necessary, therefore mandatory, then we're essentially saying that the remaining hours aren't necessary. And, um, you know, I'm not saying that they're not, but I'm saying that's what that's what it appears that we're saying in the reg. If we're saying that these are necessary, um, then are we saying that the other ones aren't? And then why are we requiring them? See, I don't necessarily I, agree with that. Yeah, I, I, I go ahead. <laughs> there are things that we want to make sure that people take every single year. It doesn't mean that the other ones aren't beneficial or necessary, but they may not be necessary to take every single year. And we want to make sure that year after year after year, they're not choosing from these classes and never taking these classes that we think are important. So I'm not saying that it means one is, you know, necessary and those aren't. These are just core components that we think somebody should have every single year. And I do think those need to be revised a little bit. Um, and I'm sure everybody has different opinions on how they want those revised, and I think they'll send them to, to Robert and... Um, so we want there to be a wide variety to choose from, um, but there are a few things that I think all of us would agree, and we might not agree on the same few things, but I think there's a few things that all of us would agree that need to be taken every year for CE. Um, and the rest of them, you know, pick and choose, make it interesting, but that, that to me is the difference between the required hours and then the elective hours. I think, uh, going back to I think, I don't know who mentioned it earlier, but there was a mandatory and electives mentioned. Um, I think that's a good thing that the committee should work on uh, to separate, to make sure the core competencies, as you've mentioned, are obviously the mandatory ones. And this is a good way to divide it so we can see that. Um, and then obviously we have the online and in-person. So if we have the um, mandatory online, mandatory in-person, and then the elective online, elective in person um, options would be there, so that it kind of opens up. And then listing the the mandatory classes or or subject matter uh, could be a good start for the community to work on. Um, I think definitely we've discussed and we are planning to revise those categories and expand upon them or, or at least give more detail similar to what you see, you're seeing in those regs. Um, and again, um, just like Dr. Dane um, said, I think that there are definitely benefits to allowing some electives because uh, there are uh, some unique specialties um, that are out there. For example, Dr. Azzolino, um, and his work that, you know, may not all fall in that mandatory category, but certainly the electives are beneficial for him and his expertise to um, continue to explore the current trends and how it's evolving, and that is definitely beneficial if he's going to stay in that area of expertise. So that's why we were thinking um, mandatory versus electives, just in the same manner you would have for your core curricular classes um, when taking, when you know, completing your bachelor's or any other um, um, degrees. I think elective is kind of an odd, an odd way to put it. Yeah, kind, of, kind of reminds me of you know, like uh, intramural sports or something. So maybe core, core competencies and then other classes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand what you're saying, and obviously it helps break us break it down for us. But a, elective makes it sound like you know, pottery or yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so maybe core competencies and then then other classes. Okay, just yeah, yeah, yeah. And these are all comments that 
we can submit to. Um, did that give you more information, Marcus? Do you want more comments? I would want more, but at a minimum, can you guys just send your ideas of the core competencies, like the courses that you absolutely need yes. to take every year? Yes. If you guys send us nothing else, that would be amazing. Well, hopefully you'll get lots of other information. Marcus, have you um, or anybody in the committee compared the requirements among other health care providers, nursing and medicine? Um, recently, I've done cursory reviews of other boards, hours, um, what do they require, providers, um, are they, do they have a similar system as far as how we have so many providers versus having a sanctioned accrediting agency that administers CE. So we've looked at a lot of different models and a lot of different things. So we're considering all these things before we move forward with this regulation package. I'm sure there's something we could grab from one or many of those professions. Just Definitely. Just streamline certainly something as simple as the, the choice of terms from elective versus core. Um, of course, no definitely. Point in reinventing the wheel, I'm sure. I don't believe in reinventing the wheel at all. <laughs> that's why we. That's why we wanted to have you guys review Arizona because it's a, a clean and a clean model that is a good foundation. So. And, and I am a firm believer that we should uh, hold ourselves to best practices. So not only do we review Arizona and adopt it, but maybe improve upon it and let them know. Of course. And even Texas, <laughs> Texas has something for us. Of course. I, um, that information is very beneficial, and thank you all for your input. And I look forward to all of the the information that you will be sending and uh, along the way. Additionally, I wanted to just um, ask Dr. Dane the appropriateness of um, answering the question regarding movement of the um, the one part of our strategic plan to the executive. Mm -hmm. Yes. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is going to be a very um, short legislative update uh, because although there's a uh, uh, and staff, you know, there's several bills out there that mentions or they deal with um, doctor or chiropractic, but none of them really um, have a an impact on the board. So, there at this time, no bill requires the board to take really any position. Um, it is, however, there was one bill that was introduced um, uh, that you may recall SB Senate Bill 746 by Senator Portantino, and that was a bill that was reintroduced, a uh, version of uh, previously AB 1992, which, as you recall, died in the previous legislative session. Well, um, the same bill, um, um, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, died again in the uh, Education Committee before. <laughs> Uh, before even was uh, got a chance to have a hearing on March 29, 2017. And at this time, uh, uh, Senator Portantino has decided not to further pursue this, uh, this particular bill. So, uh, so again, uh, at this time, there's no bill that required the board to take any positions, but we will continue to monitor uh, the other bill just in case they get amended or they get something happens during the hearing process that we have to take action, we certainly will take a look at it. I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, staff, Marcus in particular, for keeping an eye on all these bills, their net, and to uh, let us know if we need to take any action. And, uh, and at this point, really, this is a very short and sweet. I'm not sure if staff want to add anything. Marcus, do you want to add anything? Not unless you guys have questions. I, Any I questions from? Any questions. Sure. Not about the bill, but just about the committee. Um, has the committee uh, talked about scheduling legislative visits? That's a yearly thing that they did. 
Yeah, so the meet and confer, we haven't, uh, we will do it, but we haven't really set a date yet, uh, Madam Chair, and probably we'll do that at our next, uh, at our next meeting, we'll sit down and, and we'll calendar a date that best works, so perhaps, um, <clears throat> You know the best works both for the uh, staff at the uh, at the Capitol and, and for us and, and usually it happens around November if I recall uh, it's a good time to and to go in so um, we'll definitely have that at our, at our next meeting we'll let's calendar the dates okay. and then one more question sure uh, the strategic plan um, where our 3.1 which is and then specifically the action item 3.1.1 um, has your committee put that on their schedule at all? Partner with DCA Public Affairs to identify resources available to increase public awareness. Yeah, we will add um, that to our discussion. That's an ongoing discussion about um, uh, how we can best increase, you know, the uh, public awareness and um, and so on. And, um, go ahead, Marcus. Um, it's something that I've discussed with the executive officer. It's something that we will do soon. DCA recently hired a new um, executive ahead of publication, so it will be a new opportunity for us to figure out if there are resources and things that we can utilize from the department. So it's something that will take place very soon. Great. That's perfect. Thank you. That's it. Just lastly, I want to, again, thank you, thank staff and uh, for uh, your uh, help and uh, and thank Dr. Uh, Corey for your input and on the committee. And that completes my report. Thank you. All right, last thing here. Um, Madam Chair, we have a update on pending regulations. So if you guys will refer to the second page under tab 13, we can briefly review the um, regulatory prioritization list. Um, and I'll just briefly run through the status of our packages. Um, the most recent package that we've discussed for the longest time is our application package. Um, on May 1st, the board received the board received a disapproval letter from OAL. Um, the board may resubmit the rulemaking package within 120 days of the disapproval, um, and necessary changes to this package are under review with the board, staff, and legal counsel. Um, uh, with that said, there are several packages that will require amendments and changes and further consideration in light of the disapproval from OAL. Um, specifically, our CPEI package um, will require us to re-review it um, to make sure that any changes that we propose will be in line with the concerns that OAL expressed. Um, so this may extend the timeline to finish these packages, but um, overall, I think we'll have a better product. So we're going to slow down, at least on the CPEI, because we want to make sure that we get it right the first time. Um, Uniform standards will be the same in light of our previous conversation at our at the February board meeting. This package will be combined with the disciplinary guidelines, and when we do move it forward, it will be a combined package. So we took the advice of legal counsel, and we will move forward as one combined package. Um, so I've started working on that, and again, the changes in light of our application um, regulation disapproval will take those things under consideration. Um, um, and then staff are also working on the CPR regulation and also the um, delegation of authority to the executive officer. So those are our basic updates. Um, and so I'd also like to specifically address the disapproval, if you guys don't mind. Um, so we were notified um, on April, 24th, April 24th of the disapproval. The reasons for the disapproval were the failure to comply with the necessity and the clarity standards. Um, we can re resubmit this package as we intend to do shortly, um, and any changes that we make to the regulation text or any of the forms will be subject to a 15-day um, review and let that out to the public. And that, again, that's what we intend to do. We've reviewed it. Uh, we've discussed it. We're not finished with our review, but we, we tend to 
work with our legal counsel to make sure that we're doing everything we can to um, address the concerns of OEL. And so I just want to give you the heads up. Um, within the next 30 days, we'd like to schedule a te teleconference board meeting to review and reapprove the changes that we make so we can resubmit this package for approval at OEL. And then just for your sake, um, they have a 30-day review after we submit it to them. So one way or the other, we'll have a final verdict on this regulation soon. I know we've been saying that for a year, but it's soon. Um, if you guys have any more questions, or if you guys want clarity as far as what the necessity and clarity standards are, I can explain that. So whatever you guys need, um, I'll try to answer your questions. I just want to remind uh, this, the regulation that Marcus is talking about is just, uh, it's the change in the license application. Yeah. So uh, nothing overly, nothing controversial. It's just a license application, but it's taken so long. Yeah. So um, just so you guys know, our license application hasn't been updated since 1992. Yeah. Um, and so it was a huge package. There were a lot of changes that we had to incorporate. There were a lot of legislative mandates regarding um, making it easier for folks in the military to get licensed and their spouses. Um, so there were a lot of changes that were included in it. And um, it made me happy, like this is just for myself, but it made me happy that the, the concerns that OEL were technical, that they had were technical, and they weren't necessarily policy issues that they had issues with. So it gives me hope that if we make these changes, that we should be successful. I'm not going to say that we will be, but that's my hope. Just for example, um, one of the being related to the um, the preferential handling of um, military personnel and their spouses, um, we, of course, if we're going to expedite or waive a fee or something for these individuals, we have to confirm that they are in fact in the military, and so. Um, one of the things that it was rejected for is because we listed these are the forms you can submit to, or, or the documents you can submit to um, demonstrate that you do meet this requirement. And what we failed to do and didn't realize we needed to do, and this is something that's kind of new, we haven't had to do this in the past, is we didn't justify or, or explain the necessity for why those forms. And, you know, but these are forms you look on the military's website, or some of them are just forms that, you know, everybody knows. This is the form, um, you know, that shows that you've been discharged. But, um, but we had to go into greater detail about why these forms. And um, so, so there's just little things like that, that in the past, um, the, the, the um, scrutinization, if that's a word, of, um, of the regs wasn't as stringent. And things like that, wouldn't, they wouldn't have rejected a regulation for, but now they are. So I um, just wanted you to know, <laughs> give you an example of the types of things that they're looking at. Just the uber level of work that you have to do, Marcus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I have one question, not about this reg, but about yeah. the uniform standards for substance, substance abusing licensees and the disciplinary guidelines that are yeah. going to get combined. Um, we had spoken at the last board meeting about that reg being um, assigned to the enforcement committee. Is there any, any help you need from the enforcement committee on that right now? So we talked about that, and at this point, this is a regulation package that's pretty far along and, and developed, and there are really no um, issues that are technical in nature that would require board member input, so um, that's kind of where we're at. And But we did consider it, and then down the line, I think um, Dr. Lickman has expressed interest in the CPR regulation, and so we'll enlist his help for some technical help on that regulation. So it, we will, as necessary, bring the board members in for their technical expertise. All right. Uh, any public comment for items not on the agenda? Hi, my name is Rico Nell, uh, chiropractor coming from the beautiful Napa Valley. And actually, this is in line with uh, the CU credits. I just want to get some clarity and understanding that on the 24 units, uh, the 12 that can be done online, I notice that sometimes they're PDF files and sometimes it's based on, on a timeline. What's the board's position in regards to that? I know that here in California, there's both options available for folks to get. Because we're going to be providing that. And I just want to make, make sure that we're building our program based upon what you guys would like to see that be. 
this issue is not on the agenda for discussion. Oh, okay. I'd recommend that you meet with staff. I was just based on this online or the continuing education, so I was just trying to. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you recommend I do what, Since sir? it's not on the agenda, the board can't respond okay. to your question. And you recommend that I do what? Staff to discuss okay. the issue with staff. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Nell. Which? What? Oh, no, I was going to, um, I, well, I don't know if you have any of my questions. Or I probably have some of my back. I'll give, um, you, I'll give you a card, and you can contact me if you have questions. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jillian Hacker, CCA. Um, I'm really sorry. I wasn't sure about your process um, for public comment on committee reports, and I just wanted to acknowledge yours. Um, I was at the committee meeting where, um, Robert, you had asked for feedback from CCA on Arizona's requirements. We've sis since been um, asking our members what they think. We've heard back from one member so far. <laughs> um, we'll continue to compile their feedback and get them to you by the end of the month, but just wanted to say um, that particular member likes the online aspects of Arizona, um, supports 12 hours instead of 24, um, likes the annual renewal instead of the um, renewal by birthday. And then um, they just provided a general comment about the six hours earned for participation in NBCE be increased and that's to reward and, and acknowledge those trying to improve um, the profession. So those were just general feed, feedback comments, and I'll continue to compile those. So I'm going to move this back up to... Sorry. No, it's okay. I'm just moving it back up to agenda item number nine so that we can discuss this. Go ahead. Um, um, I appreciate that. Thank you for um, your input and for being at the meeting. And I, if you could email those. Sure, of course. So that we can have that when we compile everything. That would be very beneficial. Yeah. Is it better to send them as they come along or just compile them and send them all at once toward the end of I, the month? I would prefer that you send one email. <laughs> yeah, okay. Perfect. But, so I'll um, continue to collect those yeah. and put those together and send them to you. Okay, and, um, and while we're discussing this, I'd like to, um, to those in the audience and anybody who may be watching this on video um, right now or in the future, um, if you, before the end of um, this month, if you, if anybody has comments about the Arizona model and, um, you know, continuing education, um, you're welcome to send them to me. My um, email address is Robert. Julio, that's P as in Peter, U-L-E-O, at D-C-A dot C-A dot G-O-V. Um, or you could just go to the website if you need to find the spelling of my name. But um, <laughs> it's um, you can send me your comments, and we'll certainly I'll pass them on to the committee, and uh, we can take those into consideration. Thank you. And if you need to find the Arizona guidelines, if you go onto the, board, the board's website and click on board meetings, and then the date for this board meeting will be listed, and it'll say materials. It'll be under the materials link. And it's in the back, but for people who are watching it and who want it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian. Yeah. Any other public comment for items not on the agenda? Hi, Dr. Pace. Hi. Thank you. I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, one, on the Pastoral Medical Association in Texas, we have had a lot of problems with them. Um, this has been going on for several years. What has happened is that our licensees have joined them, continue to be licensed with us, and then it, the most prominent thing has been practicing outside the scope of practice. Um, we have disciplined these doctors and discipline them and then revoke their license and they still continue to do this and now say they're not working as a DC, they're working as a, a doctor with PMA. So um, obviously some of the other health professions are having the same problem. I think our state attorney general's office is trying to handle this now, but it is still an issue. So I just wanted you to know that Thank you for that feedback. Okay. Um, secondly, the FCLB. I left a brochure on each of your at your, each of your seats about PACE, and can, I would consider to use them to help you um, credential your CE providers. Um, Texas still wanted to retain control to some degree, and also the fees associated with continuing education 
applications. And so we have done that. We have still adopted PACE to help ease the burden of some of our um, vetting process of, of each of the CE providers. So PACE has its own committee um, that makes up of educators from the chiropractic colleges and other very qualified people to look at each of these classes and look at each of these providers to make sure that they're a quality uh, type of program. Um, so it's something that may ease your burden. I know Arizona is looking to add them as well, just to let you know I'm good friends with their board president. Um, and then the third thing I wanted to mention is that in Texas on our CE, our required CE, for a long time we've had f uh, four hours required board hours, meaning covering ethics, documentation, those kinds of things. We've done that a long time, and um, we require it by either webinar or live. But about two or three years ago, we decided to change that, and we have the ethics component, but we also have the rest of it has to be on our board rules, and specifically our board rules. And what we did not anticipate, but we were thrilled to find out that um, we our enforcement needs have dramatically decreased since we started this. Uh, we used to have, now we have a much less number of licensees. We have a little over 5,000 active licensees, about 5,700, including the inactive. And we used to get 30 enforcement cases a month um, to hear at our enforcement committee, and now it's down, I think, 80% and maybe even more. Since and, and what would drive us crazy, I used to be chair of the enforcement committee, and, and they'd be such obvious things that were against the rules. And, well, I didn't know. Well, I didn't know. And finally we got tired of hearing that, and, and so we changed this up and, and didn't expect such a big result. But that's the only thing I, reason I can think of that our enforcement, our complaints are down so much. And also, I just wanted to commend you on your brochures. I am very impressed with all your brochures that you have them out for, for everyone at the meeting. And I'm going to take them back and give them to our executive director at the Texas board and say, here, look at this. <laughs> I'll share with you what I shared with the administrators. Um, feel free to borrow heavily from our brochures. Yeah. We uh, would be flattering if, <laughs> you sure. know, if, you, if you want to take chunks of it and use it in your own. Um, feel free. We wouldn't have an issue with that. OK. You leave a little money on them. Yeah. <laughs> just, just send me unmarked bills. <laughs> Donations. Yes. All right. Thank, thank you. you. All right. We are going to break. Um, we're going to. Um, should I do future agenda items first? Yeah. Let's do future agenda items. Uh, so I'd like to call for any future agenda items. From, from the board, anybody? And from public future agenda items? Okay. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll set up for our hearings. Um, it's going to be a short lunch break. I'm going to let the board know that there's a cafeteria across the way in the other DCA building. Probably your best bet to get a lunch and get back here because we're going to try to get back in about 30 minutes. Um, any place else, if there's going to be a line, it's going to be hard to get what to. If, so. It's 1224 right now. Why don't we say 1 o'clock? 1 o'clock. Okay. So uh, the building directly across the parking lot, there's a, there's a cafe over there. Okay, thank you.